silence, court rise. The Queen on the application of Wilson and others, and the Prime Minister and another. Yes, someone. My Lord, I have here with Professor Lefteriadis, uh, instructed by Cross, uh, Sir James Eby and Mr. Barrett appear to be defending. Yes. Uh, you should have had some additional documents. A second witness statement from Mr. Croft, my instructing solicitor, um, and uh, additional inserts to uh, the supplementary bundle, page 5 and 300. Yes. Thank you. Um, now, we noted that a summary of the case on the uh, court website said that none of the claimants could or did vote in this referendum. That's an error that somehow crept into Mr. Justice Oosley's judgment. It doesn't derive from anything in the papers or said orally. Yes. Uh, and it's not correct. All of them had both the right to vote and exercise their right. Yes, and we, we understand that. Now, uh, turning to the case, I'm going to make submissions in the following order. First, I'm going to make a general introduction regarding the case. Secondly, I'm going to summarize our ground of claim and explain what we're challenging and in particular, why Mr. Justice Oosley mischaracterized the claim and erroneously uh, understood that grounds two to four were contingent on us succeeding on ground one. Thirdly, I'm going to look at the legal position on two points that are essential to the case. The first point is what is required for an electoral or referendum process and outcome uh, for it to be democratic. And we say that what is required is compliance with the rules governing the process. The second point is what are the consequences of those requirements not being met under either international standards, common law, or statute where a statutory remedy applies. Uh, and we say, at first, the result is void, at least in the case of a binding decision, such as an election or a binding referendum. And secondly, there is a right to a remedy by the individual who has had his right to vote within a lawful process um, uh, breached or undermined. He has a right to vindicate uh, that breach. Um, now, we say that these two points apply in different ways to the two key grounds, and I'll explain uh, that when I reach them. Fourthly, I'm going to briefly refer you to the findings of the Electoral Commission regarding the uh, electoral offences, the data offences, and now uh, the criminal investigations, uh, including into foreign funding. And fifthly, I'm going to turn to the grounds of claim themselves and consider their substance and timing, uh, as well as deal with the costs issue very briefly. Turning then to the general introduction and the importance of the case, this is a case of grave constitutional importance. We seek here permission from the court for it to be heard and heard as a matter of urgency. But Mr. Justice Oosley dismissed the claim largely on the basis of time and administrative convenience. In our submission, he was wrong to do so. Well, he dismissed on merits as well. He dismissed partially on, on merits. On both. Um, well, not, not partially. He said that he dismissed it on, term, on grounds of delay. Uh, and then dismissed it as well on grounds of merit. Uh, yes, save that in relation to the common law argument, he said that that was not unarguable. Uh, so I'll, I'll take you to that. Um, ground two, we say, is manifestly within time. Uh, moreover, in a context where in reality the claim could not have been brought in the, at an earlier date, there being no fact-finding body except the Electoral Commission, such an approach risks significantly undermining faith in the legal system that upholds the rule of law in the Constitution. It is not an overstatement to say that there is enormous concern that a significant number of serious illegalities found at a criminal standard by the Electoral Commission have taken place in the referendum, uh, as well as the possibility of further criminal charges and that this has not been taken seriously by the executive. The claimants come to the court to challenge that failure. As to administrative convenience, for the United Kingdom to leave the EU, thus depriving millions of 
individuals and businesses of their rights and freedoms on the basis of an undemocratic vote, which by definition could not, as a matter of law, represent the will of the people, cannot be, we say, administratively convenient. Uh, indeed, put another way, there is nothing administratively convenient about treating an unlawful referendum as lawful. Do you say that even if the, um, uh, even if the illegality was not material? Uh, well, I will take you to that because, uh, no, because we say essentially uh, that the rules were breached in such a way, in such a widespread way, that they were material. But we are not, um, we are in ground two, we are saying that the, the Prime Minister has to respond to what has been found by the Electoral Commission. Uh, and she has not responded by saying they are not material. I, I'm sorry, I, I understand that you say that the, the, these illegalities um, uh, are material, I understand that. Uh, but do you say that um, uh, even if they were not material, um, then the court uh, can uh, and should intervene? In relation to ground two, if, if the court found that they were not material uh, and therefore uh, there was no basis for the Prime Minister even to have regard to them, um, then uh, no. If, however, they are arguably material, as we say they are, then we say it falls to the Prime Minister to consider those illegalities and to consider how to respond to them. Yes. So we recognize that these are not normal times and that the court may say or may wish to say that the constitutional position of our country now lies entirely within the hands of Parliament. But we submit that that would be an abrogation of its jurisdiction and that the court has a responsibility to exercise this. The matters before the court are legal issues that require legal resolution. In order to have faith in the rule of law and democracy, the electorate and the claimants have a right, we submit, to have these <coughs> issues determined. We say indeed that it would be grossly prejudicial to the interests of everyone in this country for the court not to hear the case at a full hearing, where the authorities and facts can be fully explored. Nor indeed can it be said that permission from this court to enable the claimants to have their case heard properly ca would cause ripples or chaos where there is some kind of administrative order. There is no such order. Far then from it being contrary to administrative convenience then for this case to be heard, it would enable, even provide, a legitimate basis for pause, for reassurance that the rule of law is strictly upheld, for the restoration of legality. We add, moreover, that in a case dismissed for delay, there is some irony in the fact that we are now more than six months after the grounds were in fact issued, and the case could already have been heard and determined. Time for the Prime Minister to exercise her discretion to take steps within the Article 50 process is fast running out. If, as we submit, the Prime Minister's refusal to take any steps in response to the serious electoral offences that have been established beyond reasonable doubt and others that are under criminal investigation is arguably unlawful, it is essential that this Court have a full hearing to determine that question expeditiously. Otherwise, we submit there is a serious risk of irreparable harm to our democracy, and we therefore seek not only permission, but expedition. I turn then to my second point, which is the grounds itself. Yes. There are three essential elements to this application, which are separate and severable. The first element is a challenge to the decision of 12th of July 2018 of the defendant to continue to treat the referendum result as constituting the democratic will of the people, and therefore as binding on her due to the government's promise to give effect to the result in its manifesto. Uh, we say um, that this is unreasonable in circumstances where the Electoral Commission has found serious electoral offenses by vote leave, the main campaign, and by leave.eu, a permitted participant. And this is ground two, or B, in the skeleton that is before uh, your lordships. If I can take you first to the pre-action uh, protocol letter. 
that is at uh, page 177 of the bundle. Now see, my lords, that this letter is dated the 5th of July. This is the fair vote this letter. This is the fair vote letter, which was adopted in full uh, by uh, my instructions to visitors in their uh, free action letter. Yes. Now, this, in fact, is a letter that was written prior to the free action letter. This is a letter that resulted in the decision. And you'll see that it was sent on the 5th of July, uh, which is about a week before the Electoral Commission uh, produced its findings in relation to vote leave. And the reason for that was that vote leave leaked the, the uh, information in that report to the press uh, at a, a week before it, it came out. Um, so I'm writing to you as director of Fair Vote. Uh, it's becoming increasingly clear over the past several months that the integrity of the United Kingdom's referendum on our membership is deeply compromised, including the commission and cover-up of criminal offences that involve dishonest conduct. It now appears that the result may well not reflect the will of the people, as had originally been thought. And then um, he starts by listing the leak of the 3rd of July by vote leave uh, of the impending findings of uh, the Electoral Commission and then various other matters. You have frequently referred to the fact that democracy means the vote must be respected, and I have no doubt, therefore, that the validity of the vote is crucial, of crucial importance to me, as it is to the electorate. It is essential that we, as a United Kingdom, have no doubt as to the will of the people. While the referendum was advisory only and not binding on the government, you have repeatedly stated that it was the will of the people as expressed in the referendum that formed the sole basis for your decision to notify the Council under Article 50. Indeed, you and the Secretary of State for exiting the EU have repeatedly stated that the people made the decision to leave the EU and that you were implementing that decision. The question now arises as to whether, in light of the very serious and multiple issues surrounding the conduct of the parties during the referendum and the corruption of the system, such a deci decision was lawfully and fairly made. Put another way, where it whether it can properly be said to reflect the will of the people at all. I do not believe on the evidence now available that anyone could be sure that, had the rules been complied with, the result would have been the same. Put simply, you can no longer be sure to any sufficient degree of certainty that the will of the people, what the will of the people was. It follows that the factual basis on which you took your decision to trigger Article 50, namely that you were satisfied uh, as to the will of the people, was in fact represented in the result of the referendum now appears, albeit with hindsight, to have been wrong. In light of this, we ask you to reconsider, etc. Uh, and uh, various proposals are put as to what uh, the defendant might do. An independent investigation or a new referendum? Yes, and that is enlarged uh, in the pre-action protocol letter to include uh, other possible options uh, and in the grounds uh, any uh, option that the Prime Minister may come back with. We're not seeking uh, mandatory, any mandatory relief. Um, and as you'll see at the bottom, it says, if we don't hear, we will take it that you have declined. Uh, that's the last line. Yes. And therefore, the decision is effectively 12th of July when she declines uh, to respond. Uh, the pre-action protocol letter follows, uh, and you'll see ground two is... Um, at page 194 of the bundle. Uh, and then <coughs> if you look at um, paragraph 68, you'll see that B, C, and D effectively relate to ground two in terms of what's being sought. Uh, paragraph A relates to ground one. Um, Now, my Lord, we note that in a binding referendum, the findings of the Electoral Commission would have rendered the result void. We ask then how it can be rational to simply ignore these findings, let alone continue to treat them as binding, merely because there is no statutory mechanism available to void them by virtue of the result being advisory only. 
We say that the principles of legality and constitutionality require the Prime Minister to take cognizance of what she now knows. Well, just pausing for a moment. Um, if, the, um, if an election or a referendum is binding, uh, then the representation of the People Act kicks in. That, that sets out um, uh, the circumstances in which um, the election or uh, referendum um, of, is void. It's slightly, slightly more complex. In the context of an election, that's correct. Yes. In the context of a referendum, it depends on the adoption of certain regulations. So in, there's some regulations. No, you're, you, you, you're right. No, no but, you, that's absolutely but right. Yes. But just looking at an election, yes. because a referendum is probably going to be the yes. subject of separate statutory yes. provision. But in terms of an election, uh, the uh, representation of the People Act um, um, bites. Yeah. So, so we know uh, exactly what the consequences are. Yes. Because Parliament has told us. Exactly. Um, uh, Parliament didn't do that exactly. uh, in the statutory scheme here. Yes. And, and what they did was they set out in paragraph 19 of Schedule 3 to the 2015 Act the circumstances in which judicial review, um, uh, judicial review could be ma may be made. Is it? In relation only to um, the counting of votes. No, quite. Yeah, but that, that was a specific, yeah. but what they didn't do... So Parliament do considered when judicial review might be available, and that's what they said. Yes. I, I appreciate but that you say that that leaves um, some common law power in the courts to interfere with the election, but that's what Parliament is determined in the Act. But, my Lord, what I'm considering at the moment is ground two, and in relation to ground two, the relevance of the fact that in the context of a binding referendum or an election, uh, one would have access to a remedy whereby the result would be quashed. The relevance of that to ground two is how can it be reasonable for the Prime Minister to ignore uh, the fact that had it been binding it would have been quashed in considering uh, what to do. But, but my, my response to that, to which you haven't responded yet, is, is that that the binding election is subject to a statutory scheme that this referendum is not subject to. Isn't that the answer to that? Um, no, I'm not explaining myself well then, because uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the Prime Minister is faced with a piece of advice. The advice she believes is the will of the people. Uh, and she continues on the basis of that advice. It is for her to decide what to do with that advice. And as found in the Webster case, she decided to trigger Article 50. But not as a result of the referendum, but as a result of the 2017 Act. No, as a result of the referendum. So her decision, and I can take you to all that, her decision <coughs> is categorical, and that is found also in Webster. Her it is the Prime Minister who takes the decision, not Parliament. Uh, under what? Uh, under the power granted by Section 1 of the 2017 Act. No, quite. Yes. So, the, so the, the 2017 Act gave the <coughs> Prime Minister power, yes. in brackets that she otherwise wouldn't yes. have had, uh, to have um, served the withdrawal notice. Exactly. Yes. So the, the power derived from the Act. Exactly. Yes. So the Prime Minister has an open power given to her by Section 1 of the 2017 Act. In Webster, the Divisional Court decided that the decision was taken not by Parliament, and this indeed was the submission of the Prime Minister in that case. The decision to leave was taken by the Prime Minister. Yes. Okay. So she exercised her power given by Parliament under the 2017 Act. She decided to notify. There were two reasons for that decision that she has repeatedly given. One was that the advice expressed the democratic will of the people. Uh, and the second was that she or they in their manifesto had promised to give effect to that will. Yeah. So those were the only two bases on which she made the decision. The question then is when it becomes clear by virtue of findings of the Electoral Commission that there were serious illegalities in the course of the referendum, illegalities that had they taken place in a binding referendum would have led to that referendum being quashed. Is it reasonable 
for her to continue resolutely uh, and insistently uh, with the view that that is still the will of the people. And our submission is that it is manifestly unreasonable for her not to take cognizance of these extremely important findings that have been made at a criminal standard of proof. Yes. Now, we say that the unreasonableness of that position by the Prime Minister is exacerbated by the fact that in addition to the illegalities established by the Electoral Commission, the uh, Information Commissioner's Officer has now fined Leave.eu £120,000 for data breach. Is, uh, it is investigating vote leave. The DCMS on Monday made findings, or didn't make findings, gave, gave its report in relation to Russian interference and voter manipulation. Put bluntly, the illegalities are so serious and so widespread as potentially to corrupt the whole process. And we say it is up to her to decide what to do about it. But what she cannot do is simply say, it's not a matter for me. And yet, my lord, that is precisely what she has done. Um, she might decide to seek an extension of Article 50. She might decide to hold another referendum. She might decide to put the question to Parliament. She might decide to revoke the Article 50 notification. She might decide to order a public inquiry. We are not seeking mandatory relief. What we are saying is she cannot simply ignore what has happened. So, my lord, this is a freestanding ground. It concerns a recent decision, which was challenged well within time, indeed less than four weeks uh, after it was made. Uh, and we consider that there are arguable grounds to say um, that her conduct uh, and response decision was unreasonable. The second ground is the question of whether the referendum process itself involved corrupt and illegal practices as a matter of common law. It is not a challenge to the outcome or result of the referendum, as Mr. U Justice Usley characterized it. We're not challenging the number of votes. We are raising issues regarding compliance with the law governing the conduct of the referendum. My Lords, this ground depends on the findings of the Electoral Commission. The claimants are asking the court to exercise their declaratory jurisdiction to hold that the factual findings of the Electoral Commission constitute corrupt and illegal practices as a matter of common law. Accordingly, the grounds of claim did not arise until the Electoral Commission made those findings. Um, now, the relief sought is declaratory. Uh, we do not, in fact, need to seek uh, a, a declaration that the corrupt and illegal practices vitiated uh, the referendum. And that, that's sought in the, in the claim? Yes, my lord, but we, we, uh, we accept that it may be um, more appropriate for the court simply to declare that the practices or the illegalities found by the Electoral Commission constitute corrupt and illegal practices as a matter of common law, uh, and leave it at that. So uh, th th this, this may be important. Um, I I in the claim, um, relief was sought, including um, the quashing of the decision to notify and the notification itself. Uh, is that mm. abundant? Well, uh, my lord, that is secondary. Those are grounds three and four. Well, uh, we'll, come on yes. the, we'll come on to the grounds. Yes. Um, but it, uh, is that relief abandoned? It's quite important um, because um, there, may be, there may be a dispute as to whether it's even arguable that the court can, um, at common law, uh, outside um, the powers given to it by Parliament, uh, interfere with election results, with referendum results. Well, my lord, the, the, the key point there is that you would not be interfering 
with election or referendum results. We would if we quashed the notification, no, because Lord. you say that the notification is based on the referendum results. No, my Lord, because the notification is a decision by the Prime Minister based on advice by the people. Based now, on the referendum results? Yes. So, so if, if um, you, but you're seeking to quash the notification on the basis that the referendum result is, in inverted commas, bad. What we are uh, saying is that if there were, if these illegalities constituted corrupt and illegal practices, uh, then uh, the referendum was not democratic and lawful. It did not express the will of the people. So the decision of the Prime Minister uh, to notify on the basis of the will of the people was based on an error of law, error of fact of law. And secondly, that Parliament did not intend to empower the Prime Minister uh, to notify in circumstances where the referendum result or the referendum process was unlawful. That, that, is, that is a different... Uh, point to the point as the ground one, which is a declaratory relief. Um, and if my lords were um, not minded to grant permission on three and four, for example, uh, then one and two stand as a freestanding, um, freestanding mm -hmm. grounds. And indeed, we say that it's extremely important for Parliament and for the Prime Minister to know whether, as a matter of law, the illegalities found by the Electoral Commission constitute corrupt and illegal practices as a matter of common law. Uh, and your lordships may then think it's a matter uh, for the executive or parliament to decide what to do about it. But that declaratory relief is obviously extremely important to them. Do you take issue with Ms. Justice Uzi's characterization in the case in paragraph 45 of your judgment that the attack on the referendum is my lord? is at the heart of your case on, on the problem as? Not, not in the way that uh, Mr. Justice, Mr. Justice Oosley characterises it, no. Um, and I hope that that will become clear through my submissions why, why we don't say that. Obviously, it's key. the key point in the case is did the result of the referendum express the democratic will of the people? Because that was an essential fact uh, in the Prime Minister's decision to notify. But it's concomitant of that that the referendum is bad, using the equal phrase. Yes, the referendum process was unlawful, as found by the Electoral Commission. And therefore, why isn't Ms Justice Uzi's analysis correct that at the heart of this, it's an attack on the referendum result itself is what you say? No, it's an attack on the uh, compliance with the rules or laws uh, that governed uh, the referendum. And under the common law, uh, there would be no need, in fact, to show uh, that it uh, did or could have caused, um, did cause a, a different result. Uh, because the illegalities were so widespread, I'll take you to the cases on that, the illegalities were so grave and so widespread uh, that they themselves uh, render the process unlawful mm. such that the result cannot have fairly expressed uh, the free will of the people. Now, so to the third and fourth grounds, uh, my Lord, uh, is right, uh, challenge the legality of the notification decision, but they challenge the legality of the Prime Minister's decision yes. to notify. Uh, and they do, therefore, depend on a retrospective application of the findings of the Electoral Commission that render a decision of 29th March 2017 unlawful, albeit that that information was not available at the time. Now, our submission is that Mr Justice Oosley was wrong to refuse an extension of time on the basis of administrative convenience in light of the consequences entailed, both in terms of leaving uh, the European Union and also faith in the democratic process. So you accept it was out of time, um, but uh, simply that um, 
the judge was wrong to refuse an extension. Yes, uh, for grounds three and four. Yes. And I hope I've explained why I say grounds. I will go into that in more detail. No, no, where the, where, um, so the legal position, the key, the two, this is my third point, the two uh, key legal points in the case. The first question, what does democratic require? And we say it requires substantial compliance with the modalities laid down by Parliament for the vote. And absent substantial compliance, uh, the process is not democratic. Um, and if it's not democratic, we say, it is not capable of expressing the free and fair will of the people. And the reason, I, I think I've already explained, uh, we say this is important, is because it was the sole factual basis for the decision of the Prime Minister to take the UK out of the EU. If it was wrong or open to serious doubt, it cannot be reasonable for the Prime Minister to proceed without responding in any way at all to this fundamental sorry, change if, in position. If what was wrong? If, in fact, the process uh, was um, uh, the, the non-compliance with the modalities of the referendum as laid down by Parliament were so widespread uh, that uh, there was effectively non-compliance, then the referendum is incapable of expressing uh, the democratic will of the people. Sorry, I, I, I simply don't understand that. Uh, I'm sure it's my fault. Um, insofar as there was non-compliance, well, um, various findings have been made by the Electoral Commission uh, as to uh, breaches of the donation and spending rules. And, and we, we've, we've all read about those because you've read the, the, the report. Um, th those are the breaches that you rely upon, as I understand it. Um, now, w w when you say n n the non-compliance was so widespread, that, 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 that's the non-compliance. So serious, I should say. Well, well we, we, we know what the... We, we all know what the... Um, uh, 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 breaches are because there have been findings by the Electoral Commission. Um, where do you go to from there? Um, there are various um, criteria set out in uh, the Representation of the People Act as to um, uh, what would um, be good grounds to avoid to void uh, an election. You seem to try and incorporate those into the common law, but, but w w what's what are the criteria? Well, the, the RPA, in fact, uh, codifies and incorporates the common law. It's the other way around. And, and it says in section 1642 that it excludes uh, the rest of the common law. Section 1642 has not been incorporated in our context. But the, the point I am, am addressing here is what, as a matter of law, does the concept of democratic require? Because that is obviously an essential point in the case. But the representation of the people doesn't apply here. No, my lord. And I'm going to show you, by reference to the common law and uh, by reference to the representation of the People's Act, what democratic requires. Yes. Um, now, the defendant's answer to this question is that democratic or democracy is not a legal concept. In her words, they say that it is a value judgment and that's in paragraph 48 of her grounds uh, at hearing bundle, page 108. She has not explained whether applying her value judgment, the illegalities mean that the process was still, according to her value judgment, democratic. And if so, why? But putting that aside, it is wrong as a matter of law. We submit that at the heart of democracy is the rule of law. Indeed, it's trite to say that the rule of law or constitutionality is necessary for democracy to exist at all. As a matter of law, for a vote to be democratic or express the democratic will of the people, the referendum or the electoral process in which the right to vote is exercised must be conducted lawfully. Put another way, the modalities of democracy as laid down by Parliament must be complied with. Uh, and this could, I'm sorry, could, could you just give me the reference to the grounds, the respondents' grounds? Which it's paragraph, for, uh, paragraph 48, HB 108. Now, the principle that the modalities of 
the vote must be complied. Uh, our, our key is in the case of Mohan, which my lords can find in tab 14 of the bundle. Is the, phrase, <coughs> the phrase used in paragraph 48 is, is it's a political yes. or value judgment? Yes. And we say that is quite wrong. Uh, that it is, goes way back uh, in history that democratic means compliance with uh, the rules that governed uh, the vote. Now, if we go to paragraph 33 of Lord Hodge, now this case concerned uh, the franchise. Um, oh, sorry, can I invite you to read paragraph 47, just before you get to 48? Yes, paragraphs 47 and 48. Yes, my lord, we don't uh, quarrel with 47 and 48 because uh, we're not talking about the number of votes uh, cast. We don't know what the position would have been had the law been complied with. What we are talking about is the modalities uh, of conducting that vote. And we say that's integral uh, to legality. When you say we, we, we don't know what would have happened if there had been no breaches, um, I didn't understand you that, that you were abandoning this point, but um, do you abandon the point that um, the breaches were material in this sense, um, that had they um, uh, not happened, uh, then probably the result would have been different? That's Professor Howard's evidence. We don't abandon that point. We just say that it's not uh, the, the first test. So, so, so I, I just want to make sure that I've, I've, I've got your this submission correct. Um, this this was an advisory referendum. Um, if the um, if um, due to um, if if the um, defects in the procedure that you've identified and rely upon um, are judged uh, not to be material in the sense of um, uh, resulting in the um, uh, referendum result, or to put it the other way around, um, that um, uh, if the breaches hadn't occurred, the same result would have um, uh, happened. Um, it, you say, nevertheless, um, the courts have got the power to uh, declare the advisory referendum or um, uh, decisions taken on the basis of this, of it, uh, to be uh, unlawful. My Lord, we we, uh, we do the test, the relevant test, which I will take you to, is whether there was substantial non-compliance with the rules. Well, let, let, let's 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 say not not in this case, in a hypothetical case, let's say there was substantial non-compliance with the rules yes. on any view, yes. um, but. Uh, the result was such that um, uh, one could um, have confidence in it, that, that those who were being advised by this advisory referendum uh, could have confidence in it. Nevertheless, you say that um, uh, the referendum could not be relied upon. My Lord. And the courts would have to declare it um, and any decisions based upon it to be unlawful. No, my Lord, we're not asking you to declare the referendum. Asking you that the, the legal position is that if there is substantial non compliance with the rules, then as a matter of law, the result of a binding election. But this isn't binding. Yes. This exactly. is advisory. Exactly. Exactly. 
So then the question arises in relation to ground two as to whether uh, in such circumstances it would be reasonable for the Prime Minister to continue. Now, if the Prime Minister could show that despite substantial non-compliance, there was a real basis for uh, sufficient confidence that the result uh, would have been the same in any event. If she could show that, it may be arguable on her part that it would not be unreasonable to continue with the process. But that's not where, where we're at. No, but you're bringing the challenge. No, but my Lord, she's not arguing that. What she is arguing is I don't even have to consider this. Now, if she had come back and said, I have looked at all the evidence and I have decided that uh, these um, uh, breaches, albeit that they were substantial and would avoid a binding result, uh, are not uh, such as to make it unreasonable for me to continue because A, B, C. We would be in different territory, but that's not where we are. Um, does the matter that Parliament has subsequently ruled to pass legislation? Uh, no, my lord, it doesn't. It doesn't matter in our submission because we're talking about uh, the conduct of the prime minister, uh, and and therefore there is no, um, there's been no decision in relation to this issue. The Parliament is sovereign. But par it's not been a matter that's been before Parliament. If I can just take you to the Mohan case, if we go to um, paragraph 33, Lord Hodge. Now, this case was essentially concerned with whether Article 3 of Protocol 1 conferred a right to vote in referendums, which the majority held it did not. Uh, it also raised the question uh, as to what the common law right entailed. But all of their lordships accepted that the right to vote was fundamental, a fundamental constitutional right, and the content of the right was a right to vote in accordance with the modalities laid down by Parliament, put simply in accordance with the rules. Uh, so where the rules are flouted, the right to vote in a lawful process and the democratic mandate thereby created is in our submission negated. So if we go to 33, we see um, <coughs> yes. uh, Lord Hodge. I have no difficulty in recognising the right to vote as a basic or constitutional right. And that's an individual right. Yes, it's a right to vote, but it's not a right to tick a box. But it's, a, it's, it's an individual right. Yes. It's the right in the voter. Yes. But, but what it incorporates is not simply the right to put a tick in a box. It incorporates a right to vote within a, a, an, an election accordance, in accordance with law. Yes. And that's obviously important because if you simply had a right to vote in, which, in an election in which people could cheat, it wouldn't be worth anything. No, quite. Um, so then... It's also not in doubt that the judiciary have the constitutional function of adapting and developing the common law through the reasoned application of established common law principles in order to keep it abreast of current social conditions. Nor is it controversial to suggest that judges can take into account rules of international law which are binding on the United Kingdom when interpreting statutes and in developing the common law. Uh, and then a reference to Lord Sumption in the Chester case, the courts have for many years interpreted statutes and developed the common law so as to achieve the consistency between the domestic law of the United Kingdom and its international obligations so far as they are free to do so. And I'm going to refer you to the Venice Commission, albeit I accept that it is not a legally binding rule of international law. And then at the bottom of paragraph 34, the UK Parliament through its legislation, has controlled and controls the modalities of the expression of democracy. And that is essential to our case. 
It is the modalities of the expression of democracy in which individuals have a constitutional right to vote. Uh, and then that the is next sentence is of some importance. Uh, it's not appropriate for the court to develop the common law in order to supplement or override the statutory rules which determine our democratic franchise. In my submission, that is not relevant to our case uh, because what was being asked here is for an expanded franchise that had not been provided by Parliament. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, that a right to vote was being sought that by, had not by, been by granted. By prisoners, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so what the um, judge said, if one looks a bit further back in the paragraph, is he talks about the historical right uh, development of the uh, franchise and how it is always, has always been Parliament that has decided who can vote. Uh, so what he was saying is that the argument was we should use the common law to expand the franchise. And Lord Hodge rejected that and said, no, that would not be an appropriate uh, way to use the common law uh, because of the history which he, he had just recounted. So if, my Lord, you turn to Lord Kerr at um, paragraph 85 to 6, um, he doesn't want to express a view as to whether there's a common law uh, right to vote. Um, the common law can certainly evolve along oh, sorry, the which paragraph? Paragraph 86. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the common law can certainly evolve alongside statutory developments without necessarily being entirely eclipsed by the latter, and that's obviously important. And democracy is a concept which the common law has sought to protect by the incremental development of a system of safeguarding fundamental rights. In this regard, it marches in step with European states, uh, and then a reference to Lauter Pact. In European states, the protection of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law are interwoven and all part of the domestic uh, and legal system. Uh, so, my lord, we say that where the modalities of the right to vote are to a, sig a significant extent not in complied with, it cannot be said uh, that the process is democratic. And this goes back, right back in the common law, uh, and there's a case 1825 in tab uh, two of your bundle, the Faulkner case. Now that case concerned uh, the voting for a priest uh, in a parish, um, and at that time there was no secret ballot. That only came in 1868. But the key point is at the bottom of page 1129, starting third line down with, at the end of the sentence, the present action is brought for a false return to a mandamus by which the defendants have certified that the plaintiff was not duly and according to the custom of the parish elected, because the rules relating to election were customary rules in the parish. I'm sorry, again, it's me. It's page 1129. 1129, the last, ba Justice Bailey, right at the yes, bottom. Sorry, got it. Um, it appears that before the election began, it was decided that the votes of persons who had not paid the church rates should not be received. That appears to me not to have been a legal resolution. If, however, it was a good and legal rule, then Mr. Robinson had the majority of the votes, because at that time you knew exactly who, who could vote and who had voted. If it was an illegal resolution, as it is impossible to say how many persons may have been kept away, i.e. you don't know what would have happened if it had not been adopted, on the supposition that it was to be a settled rule, I think the election is void. I am disposed to think that an election under such a rule could not be good without the consent of all electors. Um, but taking the right of election to be in the parishioners at large, to whom no such disqualification applied, and interestingly there, the right to election applies uh, to the parishioners at large, the whole, the whole lot of them. The question is whether the mode of election pursued in this case was legal. Uh, and he thought it was not legal. If it was not legal, he thought if it was not legal, it was void. So the position goes right back into the common law, and it's not really that surprising a submission. 
Now the second question is what are the consequences when the rules or modalities laid down for the exercise of the right to vote are significantly breached? And we say there are two. First, any binding decision is void. Obviously you can't void something that's merely advisory. Secondly, a remedy must be available to enable an individual to vindicate uh, his right to vote in a lawful process according to the modalities laid down by Parliament. Can you give us those two propositions again? I'm yes. For myself, I was writing down. Sorry, what my lord. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to go quickly because I've got so much to cover, but uh, important points. So, so th the issue is the consequences of an undemocratic uh, process. And the first consequence in a binding uh, election or referendum is that the result is void. Obviously, that doesn't apply to advice because you can't void advice. Secondly, a remedy must be available to enable an individual to vindicate or assert his <coughs> right to vote in a lawful process, that is, in accordance with the modalities laid down by Parliament. Uh, and that uh, remedy must either be available by statute, as it is, for example, in the RPA, or under the common law. Uh, and uh, that uh, is made clear in the case of Ashby, which is tab one of your bundle. I'm sorry, just, uh, I need to take some notes of this. Sorry. So there must be a remedy. To enable an individual to vindicate or assert his right to vote uh, in a legal process in accordance with the modalities uh, laid down by Parliament, either, and now I'm afraid... Yes, sorry. Um, I, when I say... I say, within a lawful process, slash, according to the modalities, I'm using the quote no, from no, Lord Potch, yes. But what would um, you say next? And um, he must have a remedy with it before a court. Uh, he must be able to vindicate that right. Uh, now, if there's a statutory route, fine, we have uh, a right to petition <coughs> an electoral court in elections or binding referendums. If there's no statutory route, uh, then a common law route or a route to the court uh, and I refer you, I'll take you to it later, uh, to the case of Ashby, tab one, which is a 1700 case which makes that clear. And that was a case in law, that was a case for damages? Yes, because he couldn't vindicate his right to vote at that time. Uh, uh, it didn't upset the election, he had a right in damages, I no. understand that case. That, that is right. right, but the principle that I seek to get from it and uh, is that if you don't have a statutory route, so Parliament does not afford the electorate any statutory route to vindicate their constitutional right to vote in a lawful process, then the common law will provide it uh, by uh, judicial review or by a damages action. But there must be some judicial uh, remedy. Uh, unless Parliament has some ousted exactly. the common law in exactly. some other way. Exactly. Unless, uh, the, um, unless Parliament has explicitly ousted the jurisdiction of the court, and we know that in the context of constitutional and fundamental rights, that is a very difficult thing uh, for it to do. Um, and arguably uh, would, not, uh, would not run uh, in courts. So the first point uh, I've already explained is relevant to ground two uh, because if in a binding vote uh, this uh, referendum would have been void, it cannot be uh, reasonable for the Prime Minister to um, have no regard to it at all, which is her current position. Uh, the second point is relevant to ground one uh, because the claimants do not have any statutory means of enforcing their right to vote in a lawful process. The only statutory body available to find facts and illegalities is the Electoral Commission. And accordingly, the only place that the claimants can vindicate uh, their right to vote in a lawful referendum is before the Administrative Court. And they come to this court for declaratory relief to vindicate that right. 
Turning then, my lord, to the substance of these principles. The common law principles that significant illegalities in the process void the result and the voter has a right of access to court have been adopted by the Venice Commission, which provides that where there are breaches of spending rules in the referendum, the referendum must be rerun. Now, we've not put the Venice Commission reports in uh, the bundle, but they, the relevant bits are all set out in our skeleton at page 143. No, paragraph 70 to 74. <coughs> so the Venice Commission, my lords, will see... Um, Is, uh, sorry, can you give me that page number? Sorry, it's page 143 of the Bible. The Venice Commission, in relation to good practice in referendums, which echoes the code of practice in electoral matters, provides first that procedural rules must be complied with, secondly, that campaign funding must be transparent, um, and then uh, my lords will see what it provides. It says, uh, the general rules on the funding of political parties and electoral campaigns must be applied in the event of failure to abide by the statutory requirements. For instance, if the cap on spending is exceeded by a significant margin, the vote must be annulled. And then thirdly, a right of appeal must be provided to an effective appeal body, which must be either a commission or electoral court, but in any case a final appeal to a court must be possible. The appeal body must be competent to deal with the sphere covered by the Venice guidelines. Uh, crucially, it must be able to annul the result. Now, we accept that that is not available in the United Kingdom uh, in the context uh, of an advisory referendum. Uh, but we say nonetheless that... Well, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. In that sense. Um, but we... we We say again, it's relevant when you look at the reasonableness of how the Prime Minister is proceeding. Yes. Um, now, Mr Justice Usley dismissed the Venice Commission guidelines as not providing him with assistance at paragraph 76 of his judgment, but he didn't reject the argument that the common law uh, could apply uh, as unarguable. So I'm going to go now to the common law to show you that the Venice Commission reflects its requirements. The common law enshrined in part at least, is enshrined in part at least in uh, statute. And we can find that in Morgan and Simpson, which is at tab five. Now this case concerned section 37 of the Representation of the People's Act 1949, which was the successor to Section 13 of the 1872 Ballot Act, which in fact was the first act to provide for secret ballot and lay down strict rules on the conduct of an election. <coughs> um, Section 13 of the 1872 Act uh, incorporated the common law rule that had previously applied and we find that rule set out by Lord Coleridge at page 170G. But this is the common law rule that existed prior to it being incorporated in the 1872 Act. The court adjudged, sorry, it's just under F. The court uh, adjudged that the common law principles and those to be applied under section 13 of the Ballot Act were the same. Lord Coleridge uh, stated the common law rule for parliamentary elections as follows. The true statement is that an election is to be declared void by the common law applicable to parliamentary elections if it was so conducted that the tribunal which is asked to avoid it is satisfied as a matter of fact either that there was no real election at all or that the election was not really conducted under the subsisting 
election laws. So the same point as the 1825 uh, case of Faulkner. Um, now, if we go then to the test uh, set out by Lord Denning in relation to Section 37 of the 1949 Act, which, as I said, was the successor to Section 13 of the 1872 Act, um, this is at 164E to F. My lords will see uh, the test. He carried out a full analysis of the history of the legislation and the common law before reaching his conclusions at 164E. He says, collating all these cases together, I suggest that the law can be stated in these propositions. So which page are you reading from? Sorry, page 164 at E. If the election was conducted so badly that it was not substantially in accordance with the law as to elections. So that's the test. Was it substantially in accordance with the law as to elections? The election is vitiated, irrespective of whether the result was affected or not. That is shown by the Hackney case, etc. Second proposition. If the election was so conducted that it was, substan was substantially in accordance with the law as to elections, it is not vitiated by a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls, provided that it did not affect the result of the election. Third proposition. But even though the election was conducted substantially in accordance with the law as to elections, nevertheless, if there was a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls and it did affect the results, then the election is vitiated. Applying these propositions, it's clear that in this case, although the election was conducted substantially in accordance with the law, nevertheless, the mistake in not stamping 44 papers did affect the result. So that is the uh, common law rules uh, incorporated first into the 1872 Act and then into the 1949 Act. And if my lords could sideline at 161A to E uh, and 169D to H. Uh, they are the important uh, paragraphs. Now, the 1983 Representation of the People's Act codified parts of the common law, providing explicitly for when an election should be voided for corrupt and illegal practices. And that we've set out in paragraphs 61 and 62 of our skeleton. Uh, if we go to tab 21, we see no, the Yes, so, so my lord, the, the RPA we put in tab uh, 21, uh, and we see the relevant rules, section 159 and 164, but I'm actually going to take you to those sections in the case of Airland, uh, which is at tab 60. If we can start at paragraph 20 from if a candidate in the first line. If a candidate is elected in breach of the rules of elections laid down in the legislation, then he cannot be said to have been democratically elected. In elections, as in sport, those who win by cheating have not properly won and are disqualified. Nor is it of any avail for the candidate to say, I would have won anyway because cheating leads to disqualification whether it was necessary for the victory or not. In recent election cases, for example, it has been proved that candidates were elected by the use of hundreds of forged votes. Would anyone seriously claim that those candidates had been democratically elected? Um, and then if we go to section 159, which is set out of the RPA, which is set out of paragraph 23,
we see that Section 159 provides that if a candidate who has been elected is reported by an election court personally to be guilty or guilty by his agents of any corrupt or illegal practice, his election shall be void. And 158, um, where a candidate is found guilty of corrupt or illegal practices, whether personally or through his agent, uh, which is given an extremely wide interpretation in electoral laws, um, then the election is void under section 159, and that is set out in paragraph 29 to 30 of the judgment. So the process before the electoral court is the court determines that the candidate has by himself or his agents been guilty of corrupt or illegal practices. The court reports that finding, and the finding renders the election void. And then at 30, uh, the consequences uh, of that are set out. Um, and then if we go to 33, an important feature of this ground for avoiding an election is that the petitioner does not have to prove that the corrupt and illegal practices were likely to have affected the result of the election. Mere proof of the practices by the candidate or his agents is sufficient to avoid uh, the election. And then um, I should say that this is a simplification because 26 to 28 of the judgment, you'll see that the legislative scheme is quite complicated, but we don't yeah, need to worry about it. Parliament has completely taken over this. In terms of these elections, binding elections, Parliament has taken over. Yes. To the exclusion of uh, whatever may have been the common law. Yes, indeed. What, section 164, which I'm going to take you to, specifically excludes the common law in section 1642. So if we then go to section 164, which is at paragraph 35, <coughs> the test in 164 uh, is whether the corrupt or illegal practices, illegal payments, etc., etc., have so extensively prevailed that they may be reasonably supposed to have affected the result. Uh, and then we get the voiding provision in A. Uh, and crucially for our purposes, 1642, an election shall not be liable to be avoided otherwise than under this section by reason of general corruption, bribery, treating, or intimidation. So the old common law uh, rules are excluded. So Parliament has excluded the common law completely from binding elections and referendums. Well, sorry, from binding elections. Uh, yes, in, well, insofar as the Representation of the People's Act applies, if there was some other statute that provided for an election, but as far as I know at the moment, more or less do what it might. Yeah, yeah, my, my understanding is that all elections would be covered by the RPA. Yeah. Um, it's obviously it is different for referendums, so they have different rules applying in each different referendum, etc. Yes. Although local government referendums... Because, um, uh, at least national referendums, are, are the subject of a um, separate statutory provision. Yes, a statutory provision which enables uh, secondary legislation uh, under section 129 of PARA, uh, the uh, Political Parties Representations Act, under section 129, Minister is empowered to adopt regulations to, that can import uh, offences, other rules, etc. And, and we have the relevant regulations at the back of the authorities bundle that applied in, um, in the 2015 referendum, which essentially applied part seven of PARA uh, with some adaptations as uh, set out in the 2015. Yes. So um, 37 and 38, we see the consequences uh, consequently, the ingredients of section 164, which have, been, have to be proved by a petitioner seeking to avoid an election, are corrupt or illegal practices or illegal payments, etc., were committed, 
They were committed in an election for the purposes of promoting or procuring a candidate. They prevailed so extensively that they may reasonably be supposed to have affected the result. Um, the key points, the petitioner does not have to prove that the corrupt or illegal practices were committed by a candidate, only that they were directed to securing the election. But the petitioner does have to prove that the corrupt or illegal practices are likely to have affected the result. Avoidance of the election under Section 164, while not involving the lengthy period of disqualification that attends findings of corrupt or illegal practices against the candidate himself, nevertheless rules out the candidate from standing at the rerun. <coughs> um, and below we see the actual process, an inquisitorial yeah. court. Um, one further point in this I just want to take you to is 32 where um, it's made clear that the penalties in relation to corrupt and legal practices are entirely separate from criminal sanctions that might be imposed uh, if the candidate is prosecuted um, for an electoral offence. Uh, and the reason that that is uh, of some importance is it is being said both by Mr Justice Usley and uh, by uh, the defendant that there are criminal prosecutions pending and really we need to wait until all that is over and we say that is wrong. Uh, we have beyond reasonable doubt findings by the Electoral Commission uh, and that alone um, is uh, relevant and sufficient. So the RPA incorporated the common law uh, and codified corrupt and illegal practices uh, but the common law didn't um, continue to run and uh, crucially for our purposes in the 2015 referendum regulations uh, section 164 and 1642 most importantly was not incorporated um, as we say the common law uh, continue to run. Um, Just give me a moment, let me look at this. <clears throat> but uh, um, but, but could, could section 1642 be incorporated into a, an applied to referendum? Well, what it didn't <coughs> do, uh, I mean, in a, in a sense, it depends what, what one's looking at, because uh, if you say, well, it just doesn't matter, um, we didn't need any provisions at all as to illegality, uh, then um, you would say, well, it couldn't have been. What I, my, my point really is that Parliament... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, the, the question was, could Section 1642 have been sensibly incorporated into the, a scheme for an advisory referendum? The, the, uh, this is on the basis that uh, a, 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 an election has um, a direct result. Um, there was no direct result here. So um, what, what would it mean to say that the referendum um, was, would be liable to be avoided? No, I, 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 um, I, I, I agree with that. The, um, the point I was making was that there is no express exclusion of the common law. And we are here before the court seeking declaratory relief under the common law in ground one. And we are seeking um, relief in relation to the rationality. I'm sorry, the so, so what wasn't excluded? So what didn't happen is Parliament did not say, in our submission it could not lawfully have done so, despite parliamentary sovereignty. What it did not say is the courts are <coughs> excluded from considering the common law implications of any illegalities, corrupt practices, <coughs> etc., uh, that may take place within the referendum process. <coughs> so the jurisdiction of the court has not been ousted, and the common law continues to run. Um, <coughs> to 
just to keep in time, and I was going to take you to the um, perhaps quickly to the Bradford case, which is a, uh, a common law case when only the common law ran without. It is the policy of the law that a man should exercise, this is the first paragraph, exercise his franchise freely, uh, and therefore if undue pressure, bribery, treason, or oppression be brought to influence, his vote or vote becomes bad. If this influence be widespread in general, it vitiates the election by virtue of the common law, irrespective of particular acts of parliament. Um, and then... I mean, th th this, this case knows, um, has, has the advantage of not being in Latin, but it is very short. <laughs> yes, it's, it's not desperately helpful, but I mean, it's a trite principle of law that the common law continues to run unless uh, expressly excluded by Parliament. And, and I haven't brought... This, this, this doesn't suggest that... Um, I don't think that um, the courts have the power to interfere with elections after the event. Does it? We don't know. It's 1869. Well, it's not, so it's not a desperately helpful... Well, no, but it, we, the, the date is 1869, so um, the Parliament had given the court some jurisdiction over elections. Of course, we know from Morgan, uh, Lord Denning's judgment in Morgan, that until then, um, the courts had no part to play in elections. But, my Lord, we're not asking you to, to quash the result of the referendum. Parliament didn't provide that because, as my Lord has said, it was advisory and therefore yeah. quashing something in fact is not possible. We are uh, asking you to first give declaratory relief as to the nature of the illegalities found beyond reasonable doubt by the Commission, that's ground one. Secondly, to determine whether it is reasonable uh, in light of the nature of those illegalities for the Prime Minister to simply say, I'm not even going to look at and that's the core of our case. Yeah. Um, and the second subsidiary point was the right to a remedy, but I, I'm not going to take you now to the case that you saw, my lord, in Latin, the Ashby and, and White case. Uh, it does vindicate the right, it is true in that case, to vote, uh, because at that time elections had to be voided by Parliament, uh, and there was no remedy, so he went to the court in relation to the denial of his right to vote. Well, he was some cash, it was a damages claim. Yes, but our, our substantive point is that we have a constitutional fundamental right to vote within a lawful process, yes. and uh, we are asking the court to exercise its jurisdiction to give effect to that. Um, and the defendant says that this matter is outside the court's jurisdiction and now within the realm of Parliament at paragraph uh, 26 of its skeleton uh, before the High Court or in the original defence at 41 to 42. But we say we are not interfering with the Prime Minister's negotiation with foreign relations. Uh, we are um, asking the court to exercise its common law jurisdiction. Now, my Lord, I'm going to turn to my fourth point, which is I'm going to try and deal with very quickly. Uh, I understood from what you said earlier that you'd had a chance to look at the reports. Um, As you can see, we've read, we've read everything. So. Oh, well, I'm very, I'm very grateful. Then perhaps I can even uh, skip this bit, because I was going to point you to the illegalities found beyond reasonable doubt by the Electoral Commission. Well, well there were a number. There were a very large number, my lord, and I, I'm not going to then go through them. That's, I was going to spin through them and spin through the ICO, DCMS, etc. And, and I mean, to, to, to an extent, Ms. Justice Usley set them out in three paragraphs, to an extent. To an extent. Yes. Um, in which case, uh, I can skip that section entirely and turn to the grounds. I've covered a lot of this already. Um, Ground two, or B, in the skeleton, we say two things. First, we say that the Prime Minister, in refusing to have any regard 
or take any steps in response to the findings of serious illegalities in the referendum process alone, or combined with other significant irregularities, such as the ICO, DCMS, etc., and possible criminal conduct, uh, is proceeding on the basis of an error of law and irrationally. First, <coughs> she appears to believe that she is bound to implement the referendum result when the result was advisory. That is an error of law. Secondly, she appears to consider the serious illegalities now established beyond reasonable doubt to be irrelevant to how she proceeds, despite the fact that these illegalities are such that the process and result can no longer be considered in our submission to be democratic. Uh, we, we, we may have already been over this ground, um, and I apologise um, to the extent that we have. But you, you say that that's the case, uh, e even if um, she is not satisfied on the evidence that has been provided to her by um, the claimant, uh, by the applicant, um, that the, um, these illegalities are material in the sense of affecting the result. You say that that's irrelevant. No, my lord, I don't say it's irrelevant. Um, you say she hasn't considered it yet, therefore it doesn't arise. Is that, that's yeah, it? that's my primary position. <coughs> now, if, as I said, if she came back and said, I've looked at these illegalities, uh, I don't see how they could have made any difference to the result. Uh, we would then consider whether that decision was reasonable. And in our submission, it's highly unlikely that it would be reasonable in light of the nature of these illegalities. And, but you say that she's, she's got a duty to consider the illegalities and the effect of them, uh, even absent any evidence that they are material. Yes, ma'am. Right. Because uh, the case law I've already taken, to you, taken you to shows that failure to comply with the modalities of a voting process means by legal definition that the result, the process, cannot express the democratic will of the people. But those are the authorities I've taken you to. No, I'm sorry. Uh, and my lord, if that is the case as a matter of law, then how can the prime minister continue with a process where uh, the decision to initiate it was based on one sole factor, that the referendum produced the democratic will of the people. We know as a matter of law it did not do so. So in our submission it would be unreasonable simply to say, well it did, because law lawfully it did not. Can, can you just test that for a moment? If there was some minor infelicity in the modalities, would the Prime Minister be entitled to ignore that? Yes, my Lord. Applying the case law, a minor infelicity would not give rise to a situation where uh, the result failed to express the democratic will of the people. So calibrating it, where, where does one get to when the Prime Minister has to take notice and take action? So, my lord, for the, these, these practices, as a matter of common law in our submission, uh, amount to illegal and corrupt practices. And therefore, by definition, uh, by legal definition, <coughs> they... Okay, well, I didn't express it well. If there was a, a minor infelicity in the sense of one illegal practice by one individual, would that then require, in, in the Shire somewhere, would that require the Prime Minister then to take an extra, take action on, on your analysis? Well, one would have to go to, to the test, um, which was, uh, well, I take your point, but you're, you're effectively asking me what is substantial? What is substantial non-compliance? Uh, and how can I say that this is substantial non-compliance? Now, if one applies the RPA, uh, 
rules which adopt the common law, uh, then in my <coughs> submission that the referendum, had it been binding, would be void. Uh, so essentially, that is the answer to it. Now, if she comes back and she says, well, it was a minor ethnicity, it was not a substantial, was not a substantial breach. But that, that's the second stage. And yes. It ties into my Lord's point as to what is material. When is, when is the trigger point on your analysis that the Prime Minister had to, had to sit up and take note and take action? Well, we say that the trigger point was uh, the, si the serious illegalities found by the Electoral Commission uh, on the 12th of I'm July. Sorry, in this yes. case, but just encapsulating it in a proposition, what, what is the proposition as to when, when that moment comes to pass? How serious does it have to be? Well, it's, it's difficult to say how serious something serious needs to be. It, the, the legal language is substantial. Uh, it, it's difficult for me to... Um, go beyond the legal language or give hypothetical examples. Uh, if the Prime Minister came back and said, I've looked at this, and in my view, the illegalities <coughs> found by the Electoral Commission are not substantial, uh, that would be a judicially reviewable decision, and it would be a matter for the court to decide whether that was correct as a matter of law. But our submission is that it, the findings of the Electoral Commission are um, arguably substantial. Is the answer to be found in Section 164 in the language that, um, that the practices fail so that they may reasonably be supposed to have affected the result? Except that 159 is a more rigorous an absolute test, um, or in our, our submission, the, the appropriate test one might apply, because that was the um, common law test at large, is the test set out by Lord Denning in Morgan and Simpson. At least uh, he set out both, both limbs of the test. Yes. Well, he set out the test that if there is substantial non-compliance, it's void whatever. Um, and then if there is... Uh, compliance, it can still be void if you can show the result would have been different. Sub if there is substantial yeah, yeah, compliance. No, no, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. I understand that. And so what do you say in this case? So we say substantial uh, non-compliance. We say the only reasonable response to these illegalities, after all, these are illegalities of uh, around 8%, and I'll explain why, overspend by the main uh, leave campaign in the last week of the referendum, <coughs> uh, an 8% overspend, uh, a failure to declare spending, a cover-up <coughs> of spending, uh, a referral to the Metropolitan Police for criminal charges in relation uh, to that. Um, so those are very substantial. They are added to by the findings of the subsidiary campaign, leave.eu. Um, so, we say that the illegalities are such that the process and the result can no longer considered, be considered to have been democratic. And accordingly, the result cannot, even if understood by the Prime Minister to be advisory, reasonably I'm, I'm be... sorry to break in. When you say that, do you, do you mean really that it simply falls in uh, Lord Denning's Category 1? Yes. Um, and we say that, as a result, it was not a democratic process that was not capable, going right back to those older cases, was not capable of expressing the democratic will of the people, just as... Uh, uh, Justice Morphery in the Erlam case explains in paragraph 21 of his judgment. That being so, in our submission, it's unlawful and unreasonable for her not to take any steps in response. Uh, that, and I've already given you the examples of the kind of steps she might take. She might seek an extension, 
she might decide to hold another vote, she may revoke Article 50, she may hold a public inquiry, etc. Um, and it's simply no answer for her to say that other bodies are looking at it, it's what she says at paragraph 21 of her skeleton in front of the High Court. We say that has no bearing on her decision not to take any action, um, and indeed uh, three points require making in relation to that. First of all, the findings of the Electoral Commission were beyond reasonable doubt. That is, they were at the criminal standard. The Electoral Commission is the only fact-finding body available. There is no other body to which members of the electorate could uh, go. Indeed, they cannot go to the Electoral Commission. The um, County Court appeal that has been lodged by Vote Leave and Darren Grimes and Bee Leave is confined to a review on the law. I'm sorry, who, 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 just to my note, who, who is appealing to the County Court? Uh, Vote Leave and Darren Grimes. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, the County Court, I'll take you to that in a minute, uh, the County Court only has review jurisdiction. That's paragraph 66 six of 19, uh, Schedule 19C to para. And that's been found by the County Court last week, and we have an email from the Electoral Commission explaining the position. And again, <coughs> just a reference, paragraph 6, 6 of? Uh, Schedule 19C. Yes. Um, and then uh, it's clear from paragraph 32 of Erlam, which I took you to, that there's absolutely no need to wait for criminal proceedings to end when we're talking about voiding a result by an Electoral Court. Mr. Justice Oosley appears to have believed that without a finding by this court that the referendum was unlawful, the only rational thing the Prime Minister could do was to carry on, irrespective of what she had found out. I'm going to take you to this part of his judgment, uh, which we say is surprising. It's at paragraph 72 to 75, tab D of the main bundle. Whilst proof of a criminal conviction is objectively an uncontentiously verifiable proof of conviction, even under PACE, the substance of the conviction can be contested, although the burdens of proof will be reversed. But even if it were uncontentious at some stage, it was not uncontentious at 29 March 2017. Besides, I note that the claims do not rely on such finality for ground two, where the material is neither objective nor verified. Now, I don't understand that sentence. We absolutely do rely on the, the findings of the Electoral Commission uh, and the fact that they were found at a criminal standard and can only be reviewed in the law. <coughs> Paragraph 73. I turn to, to where they do rely on material, which includes that which is plainly not objectively verified, the merits of ground two. Some of the remarks I have made bear upon this ground as well. The claim amounts to an allegation that the Prime Minister ought to consider whether the referendum and decision and notification were vitiated and reach a conclusion on it. Uh, no, my, my Lord, she ought to consider the illegalities uh, and see whether it affects her view uh, as to how to respond to the advice. Uh, and to do so when the court has decided not to do so. So what he's saying there is, because this administrative court has refused to look at it because it's out of time, uh, she, it, it's wrong for us to say that she should look at it. So he says, um, when the court has decided not to do so, and to do so even if the court had decided that it would not decide it. This has no merit whatsoever, but illustrates how central is the attack on the referendum to this ground. Alternatively, so as I understand what he's saying, he's saying because this court won't look at it, it can't be said that it's unreasonable for the Prime Minister to look at it. We've the thrown it out on time, and the therefore it must... Not to look at it. I think yeah. you've missed, you missed a not out of anything. Yeah, like it, it, it can't, exactly, apologies. Um, and that actually derives from 60, I believe it's 63... 
So what, what does he mean by the, 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 <coughs> the use of the concept of um, the referendum being vitiated? I, I think it, this comes from ground one. So what he says is unless we win on ground one, all the rest of it falls away which I, I hope I've explained why that is incorrect. And he says, if we can't succeed in showing that the result was vitiated, albeit that that's not what we're seeking to do, but that if we can't succeed in that, one reason being because we're out of time, even though we could never have been in time, and in 63 he says the result must be treated as valid. So he says... Um, 63, if we go to the top of that, as I've said, once delay has been showed in relation to ground one, or indeed for that matter in relation to three and four, and extension has been refused, the referendum and the decision and notice under Article 50 are valid and must be treated as such. They do not have a half-life, half vitiated and uncertain until the conclusion of events. Um, and then the last line, the referendum outcome and the decision and notice are lawful. So as I understand what he's saying... He is suggesting that because the court will not examine the matter, because it's out of time, grounds one, three, and four, the Prime Minister must proceed on the basis that it was a lawful process, even though we know it was not. And then, if we go to 74, um, alternatively, it's a claim that she ought to consider those matters without reaching a conclusion that it was vitiated along with the decision and notice. But what possible conclusion can she come to without resolving it? So the court has refused to resolve it. We're saying she should resolve it. How can she resolve it? Other than that, these are issues which are for, are for other bodies to whom the statutory task of resolving them may, over time, resolve. At present, the referendum decision and notice are lawful. This court has refused an extension of time in relation to the challenge. In effect, the Prime Minister would be re required still to reach a judgment as to whether to treat the referendum decision and notice as valid for the time being or not. So she shouldn't touch it because the court has refused not to touch it because it's out of time. And then 75. The consequence would be that she would take steps on the assumption that the notice was not valid, leading to some kind of interim stay or interim relief on the whole of Article 50 process, which would be in effect to treat the decision and notification as invalid for the time being, contrary to what this court has held. So instead of saying, we've refused permission because it's out of time, and therefore we make no conclusion as to whether or not the referendum process was lawful, he says, having refused it as being out of time, it must be treated by the Prime Minister as lawful. Her only alternative is to recognise that there are issues, but to leave them to, the, to others through the statutory processes to resolve and carry on. In my judgment, that is the only rational thing she can do. So the, Mr Justice Oosley thinks that the only rational way that the Prime Minister can now proceed is on the basis that the referendum process was lawful, even though we know that is wrong. Um, and then the last line, the Prime Minister has not ignored a material consideration in the form of unlawful conduct itself. She has left that properly to the relevant authorities in whose actions it is wrong for her to interfere in any way. Well, that's fine. But uh, as a matter of logic uh, and law, it, it uh, makes no sense in terms of the rationality of the Prime Minister's conduct. But, but you're, you're saying, uh, I think, that if the Prime Minister considered that um, despite the evidence of illegality, and uh, I appreciate that there are some findings and there are some things which uh, still yet haven't been concluded, but despite the evidence of um, uh, illegality, um, even if uh, because of the lack of evidence of any causative effect of the illegality, um, sh she is still bound to what? I'm not quite sure where we go from there. Um, she's still... I, I just don't know where... We, you, you say that uh, she has to start again. I, I just don't know where we go. Why can't she say, well... Um, why, why can't she think, well, the... the, the um, 
the, the, there is uh, the evidence of the illegalities um, uh, is not material to the thrust of the referendum result. Well, uh, there's no can't... evidence that it is. Why can't she proceed on the basis well, that there's no causative effect of whatever, what, what, whatever evidence there is? Uh, my Lord, you say she can't do that. Well, we say two things. We say, first of all, the law is clear that these kind of illegalities render the process undemocratic, therefore not lawful. And that is a material, highly material factor in her decision-making. She doesn't need a court judgment declaring the referendum vitiated. No. But, but it, it, on this premise, we, we know that it's unlawful, because we're working on the premise yeah. that there's been uh, a, a overspend and other breaches. So we know it's unlawful. Um, but that's not really the, 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 the question, is it? Uh, why can't you say whatever, whatever um, uh, has happened, taking into account all of the evidence, because things still have not been uh, finally concluded, um, that, um, uh, uh, and it's an assessment, that there is confidence in the referendum result? There's no evidence that it's causative of uh, a, a, a difference. You say it's not relevant that there you, is you, no difference. You say, as I understand it, that she, she hasn't considered it, she's ignored it. She might come to that conclusion after some assessment. But that's your round two, well, I understand it. She would have to reach the conclusion that despite this not being the democratic will of the people, because it was not a lawful process in a substantial regard, despite it not being the democratic will of the people, she still believes, on whatever evidence she might have, she still believes. Uh, that the people would have voted this way had it been democratic. Had there been no breaches? Yes, but, but I ally the concept of these breaches and democratic, as does the case law, as a matter of law. And your point is that she hasn't considered that, gone yes. through that process. Yes. Can you just test that for a moment? Because these breaches... Um, overspends and so on were notorious, weren't they, from an early, early time. Uh, and indeed there was a, a, eventually a debate in Parliament in March 2018. So it was common currency that there were serious issues. So the Prime Minister would have been aware of them. And surely that um, that self denial to how he, your point about how ignoring no, no, my lord. Uh, in our submission, in our essentially that point goes to a question of, of timing. Um, but in our submission, no, it goes to the substance because you say effectively the prime minister has not considered these aspects, this, these these issues, um, and therefore her decision to proceed is irrational. Given if 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 these issues were notorious because they were public knowledge, um, how can it be said that she? Uh, so it could not be said, I'm going to get onto this when I deal with timing, but it could not be said that for the Prime Minister to uh, wait for an investigation to conclude. No, it's a different point. The point is if, if something is well known because it's in the public domain, how can it be said that an official has ignored, has not considered that aspect well, when we, it's well known? Well, first of all, we have no evidence of anything being considered. On the contrary, uh, the, all the questions in Parliament, although one shouldn't bring them here, but all the questions in Parliament were, that is a matter for the authorities. Um, as a matter of fact, at March uh, 2017, when the notification was made, uh, the investigation into vote leave uh, and Darren Grimes was closed. The judicial review proceedings were then started in October 2017 which led the Electoral Commission to reopen them in November 2017, and that then led to the conclusion in July. Uh, now, uh, in my submission, uh, to, for the Prime Minister to say, I'm not going to uh, look at press reports and consider what people are saying, uh, it's a question for the authorities to determine according to fair legal procedure what has happened uh, and whether there were serious illegalities. But once that has happened, it cannot be reasonable to say this is not a matter for me.
which is the position. Uh, the repeated position is it is still the democratic will of the people. That is the stated position. And all the rest of it is a matter for the authorities. And we say that is legally wrong. Um, so turning back to Mr Justice Usley's view that the Prime Minister is in fact obliged to proceed on the basis that the referendum process was lawful, because that is in effect what he's saying at 72 to 75 and 63 of his judgment. We say that makes absolutely no sense. First of all, there is nothing that restrains the Prime Minister's discretion, and certainly not a requirement of a finding of illegality. It is possible that no court has jurisdiction, no high court, no uh, common law court, has jurisdiction ever to make a finding as to the legality of the referendum, apart from the Electoral Commission, uh, since Parliament didn't expressly provide for that. And this court may refuse permission, for example, on ground one. It may be that no one ever went to court. Mr Justice Usley seems to have thought that the Prime Minister would still have to carry on until someone came to this court and was successful in getting uh, a declaration. What if the Prime Minister had legal advice that the Electoral Commission findings rendered the process undemocratic and therefore not capable of expressing the will of the people? What if she had advice from MI5 or MI6 in relation to corruption or Russian interference? Mr Justice Usley's position would be that she would be obliged to continue nonetheless because the court had not said anything. Now that is manifestly wrong. Turning then to timing, the question for the purposes of Part 54 and Section 31.6 of the Senior Courts Act is the date when the grounds first arose um, and uh, the case of Burkitt is the obvious one to go to. Uh, obviously we are in a, a let me see, it's a, a paragraph, tab 8, paragraphs 45 to 46. <coughs> by operation of a time limit, may deprive, deprive a citizen of the right to challenge an undoubted abuse of power. <coughs> Any such a challenge may involve not only individual rights, but also community interests, as in environmental case. This is a contextual matter relevant to the interpretation of the rule of court. It weighs in favour of a clear and straightforward interpretation, which will yield a readily ascertainable starting date. Um, then 46, secondly, legal policy favours simplicity and certainty rather than complexity and uncertainty. In the interpretation of legislation, this factor is a commonplace consideration. Um, and then for, uh, 61, 63 and 64. Uh, I, I don't want to read you because of time, 61 and 63. Um, but Lord Hope explains that there is no time limit in the uh, Scottish context. And then at the bottom of 1613, starting with, but decisions. But decisions as to whether a position, petition should be dismissed on the ground of delay are made in the light of the circumstances in which time was allowed to pass. It is, of course, the case that judicial review proceedings ought normally to be raised promptly, and it's also undeniable that the petition has let some months pass without starting these proceedings. Nonetheless, in considering whether the delay was such that the petitioner should not be allowed to proceed, we take account of the situation in which time was allowed to pass. In ex parte Caswell, Lord Goff said that he didn't think it would be wise to attempt to formulate any precise definition or description of what constitutes detriment to good administration. As he pointed out, the interest in good administration lies essentially in a regular flow of consistent decisions and in citizens knowing where they stand and how they can order their affairs. Matters of particular time, apart from the length of time itself, would be the extent of the effect of the relevant decision and the impact uh, would it be felt if it were to 
be reopened. That's the administrative decision point. Now, grounds sufficient to bring uh, the uh, ground two of the claim, so the point at which the grounds arose in relation to ground two of the claim, <coughs> arose in our submission when it was established that the main campaign, Vote Leave, had committed serious electoral offences, in addition to those found by the subsidiary campaign on the 11th of May. We brought those proceedings less than four weeks after those findings were made. Insofar uh, as it's said that the trigger should have been the 11th of May uh, findings of the Electoral Commission, which Mr Justice Easley uh, uh, suggested, um, in our submission it could be uh, well be argued that it wouldn't be irrational for the Prime Minister to say uh, the the Commission of Offences set out in the 11th of May report are not uh, on their own of such a substance uh, that I have to uh, do something about it now because it was a subsidiary <coughs> campaign. Now, I say arguable because I don't concede that point. Is that a proper test? We test for bringing judicial review proceedings is, as our stated paragraph 65 complicates and so on. The, what you're looking at is the, is the reaction of the, um, the decision maker to make a decision. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's helpful. So, so we say, uh, and we're very much nearly within time for, we think it's a two day extension needed for the 11th of May, <coughs> but the July, we say at the point when the main campaign was found to have committed spending breaches of such seriousness, at that point, it became unreasonable for the Prime Minister uh, not to take responsive steps. And at that point, we had grounds of claim. Uh, and that's why we say that's where time runs from. It is true that it's... In, in, in respect of the, the grounds based upon her failure to act, not yes. on notification. No, ground two. Yes. Ground two. On, on notification, <coughs> as I understand your uh, submissions, you accept that that's way, way out of time, but you uh, say that the judge erred in not extending time because of the circumstances. Grounds three and four, not ground one, which is uh, the declaratory relief. I'm going to come to ground one in a minute, but yes, my lord, yes, grounds three and four, yes, we accept that we're way out of time. Um, so, Mr Justice Oosley said we should have challenged within three months of the finalization of the spending returns submitted to the Electoral Commission. And that would have been uh, December 2016, add three months to that, it would have been March 2017. Now, it's impossible to see how we could have argued that the Prime Minister was acting unreasonably at that point. Indeed, she'd not even taken um, taken steps in December uh, 2016. We were in the middle of the Miller litigation at that stage. Uh, so there is no way that she was acting unreasonably. Uh, and certainly at the time of notification, uh, she had no evidence on which to believe that the result of the referendum was undemocratic. Alternatively, he says we should have brought the claim within three months of notification. Uh, again, as I've already said, there weren't even any investigations open at that time, except one that opened in April into leave.eu, uh, but the investigations into vote leave uh, were closed. Now, the defendant says everyone knew about it because of press reports, uh, and that was enough uh, to provide a ground for challenge. Um, but we are saying that the ground for challenge, the unreasonableness, arises out of her refusal to respond to criminal proof standard findings by the statutory regulatory body. <coughs> An action prior to that would have been premature on our part. The 
defendant, and indeed Mr. Justice Oosley, refers to what he says is a legal opinion by DCMS's counsel. He talks about that at paragraph 55 of his judgment. <clears throat> that was not a legal opinion provided by DCMS's counsel. That was a legal opinion provided by counsel instructed by Bindment, who were representing the whistleblower, Mr. Wiley, before the committee. It supported the contentions which were being made by the Good Law Project at that uh, time, or later, in fact, uh, just earlier, in October 2017. <coughs> it supported the contentions of the Good Law Project that, one, um, the Electoral Commission was wrong to close its investigation into vote leave and be leaves joint spending that there was man manifestly enough evidence and it shouldn't have closed it. And secondly, that the Electoral Commission had got it wrong uh, in advising vote leave that provided there was no joint working, vote leave could donate services uh, to other leave campaigns without declaring the costs of those services as part of its expenditure. And what I in not having gone through the illegalities, what I didn't say to you, I hope it's in the papers, is that if one puts the result of the Electoral Commission findings of 490,000 overspending with the findings of the Divisional Court, uh, you add another 100,000, exactly, from the 100,000 that was paid to AIQ uh, for veterans for Britain uh, for services, uh, which um, it was legally erroneous because the Electoral Commission had given the wrong advice, uh, and that's the Divisional Court's judgment in the Good Law Project. So, so the overspend was what? Do you it, say? Around 590, which comes to about 8%. Of what? 8% of, of what? 7 million. 7 million is the maximum, and this money was spent on... Sorry, that, that was the maximum for the, for the lead campaign, which was vote lead. The, 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 the aggregate um, uh, reported campaign costs for leave was something over 13 million. Because it, what, the aggregate costs include the Women's Institute. No, no, of course. Yeah, and uh, yes. you know any law firm holding a seminar or anybody who goes above 10,000. Yes. Um, but crucially, and that's actually an important distinction if you ever got into analysing the effects, uh, because, of course, Focused campaign spending is quite different from disparate uh, spending yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, so the legal opinion supported Good Law Project's view, which was vindicated in the Divisional Court, that the Electoral Commission had wrongly advised vote leave that it could donate goods and services if there was no joint working. So Mr. Justice Oosley is, is wrong to suggest that that advice somehow helped the claimants. On the contrary, uh, the claimants had quite a stiff battle in the Divisional Court uh, to uh, establish that point uh, of law. Uh, and equally, <coughs> the Administrative Court refused the Good Law Project Commission uh, to... Um, on, on the first argument, which was that there was already enough evidence in the database of the Electoral Commission and released to the public to show joint working. Uh, the Administrative Court said, there is an investigation by the Electoral Commission. It is not for us to find facts. So it cannot be said that we somehow could have come to the court uh, and established uh, facts, making it unreasonable for the Prime Minister not to respond. The Administrative Court itself said no to that. Um, and then, my Lord, we note that Mr Justice Oosley himself says that it was not unreasonable for the Prime Minister to take no steps in response to the illegalities whilst no findings had been made. <clears throat> and I took you to that in 72 to 77 of his judgment. Indeed, he went further there to say that it would be irrational for her to do so, even 
in the light of the uh, findings of the Electoral Commission. Um, for timing purposes, that point is that the judge cannot have it both ways. He cannot say, we should have brought the claim before the Electoral Commission's findings, the rationality claim, whilst at the same time saying that until full findings are made, even by the criminal courts, uh, the defendant is acting reasonably. To sum up, this ground does not depend on whether or not this court can or should declare the illegal conduct during um, the referendum corrupt or illegal. It depends purely on the question of whether the Prime Minister's refusal to take any action in response to the beyond reasonable doubt findings of the Electoral Commission and other serious findings of the ICO, DCMS, etc., open of criminal investigations is unreasonable. <coughs> so this claim, we say, is well within time, four weeks, uh, and we say it requires full examination by the court. And the defendant has provided no reason at all why she will not examine and consider what appropriate steps to take in response to the relevant findings. So, my lord, I'm going to move to ground one, um, now, this is an application for a declaration. Um, we do not seek a quashing order in relation to the referendum. The result was advisory. Um, the court, we say, can declare that the process involved corrupt and illegal practices. And it is then for the executive and parliament to decide what to do with that information. That declaratory um, relief, we say, would constitute vindication of uh, the claimant's fundamental constitutional right to take part in a uh, lawful process. And I just refer you to, I'm not going to take you to it, but you'll be familiar with the Whiteman case in Luxembourg, which is the case that decided that Article 50 can be revoked unilaterally by the United Kingdom. The reason I refer to it is because it too is merely advisory. It assists Parliament, uh, it assists the Prime Minister in knowing the position, and it is for that reason uh, that the court exercised its jurisdiction uh, to hear the case and make the declaration, and we say the same applies here. What we are therefore seeking is for the court to analyse the factual and legal findings of the Electoral Commission and determine whether, as a matter of law, they constitute corrupt and illegal practices under the common law, and if so, to make a declaration to that effect. Just, just looking at the... Um uh, claim form. Where, where is the relief set out? That, so that would help me. It's six, if I remember rightly. Um, it's been re slightly reformulated in the, in the skeleton, the consolidated skeleton of the form. Can you show us the grounds first? Yes. So six. Uh, six what? Six, paragraph six. I'm sorry, which, which, so which, pa I'm sorry, which, six which page? Page 44. Thank you. Yes. So, we seek a declaration. I mentioned in opening that we would be content for that declaration to be limited simply to saying the referendum, the process of the referendum, or the illegalities found by the Electoral Commission constituted corrupt and illegal practices under the common law. I.e. the removal of the word vitiated. I, 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 I'm, can, can we just look at the grounds yes. first? And then we can, having seen the grounds, which is what you're formally claiming, we can then move on to what you now wish to claim. But um, look, looking at paragraph one, this is the declaration. Um, the first is that the referendum result is vitiated. I'm out, and what do, do you mean by vitiated? So, um, rendered unlawful 
Um, now, I, I, uh, I make a submission here, my lord, in relation to that declaratory relief um, as to amending that, that relief to seek um, a declaration that the referendum, that the illegalities found by the Electoral Commission constituted corrupt and illegal practices as a matter of common law. Now, the reason I do that is because although this year does not annul any results, we couldn't annul results because it's uh, um, advisory only, uh, it has the same implication. So our submission would be either we say uh, the illegalities found by the Electoral Commission constituted corrupt and illegal practices um, that vitiated the referendum, or you just leave that bit out. Either way, that declaration as to what the illegalities are as a matter of common law is useful, important, and helpful for Parliament, and uh, moreover vindicates the claimant's right to have to take part in a lawful uh, referendum and to have uh, relief in respect of that. So, so it's, it's, a, anyway, it's, a, it's a declaration. Um, that the um, practices as found by the Commission amount to corrupt and illegal practices of the common law. Exactly. Um, B is that the decision and notification are vitiated by reason of corrupt and illegal practices in the referendum. Is, is that yeah, still that being is, maintained? No, we, we um, no longer pursue that. That's really. gone. Um, uh, C. C um, has gone anyway already. C has gone anyway. It, get, it went by, by reply. And D, other than the amendment that you seek, there's nothing in, there's, there's no, no. no, nothing. So, in terms of a declaration, that's the declaration that, that you now seek. Yeah. In terms of quashing order, uh, quash the decision and notification, does that still, is that still My Lord, they are subsidiary points. But, but they it, are. But are, are, are you still maintaining that we, as relief? We maintain that they are correct. They are way out of time. So um, we accept that we have a time problem on that. Uh, so so uh, is two going to go? I just want to know what, what, what the claimant is seeking. The reason I'm being a bit uh, uncertain is because um, I see that those are potentially extremely uh, strong things for the court to do. And therefore, I understand any anxiety that the court might have in I, doing I, I, that. But, but, Sonia, I, at the moment, I haven't even started to become anxious. I, all I want to know is um, the relief that the claimants are seeking. We are, um, we are still seeking that relief, my lord. Thank you. Uh, and in respect to three? Three, that is the ground two. So that's that's an order asking the prime ordering the prime minister to do something, but but really I think um, is it three B that, that is at the core of that? It's three B. Re really, I, I mean I understand why the others are there, but it's really three B. It's three B. Essentially, if uh, uh, Lordships were with us on ground two, the finding would simply be that her decision to refuse to do anything. To consider it. Yes, uh, she's and refused to consider it. We, and, we and, the, and, and the court should order her to consider it. Yes, properly. although it, in the normal course of things that would not be necessary at all, uh, in the sense that no, no. the finding of illegality would be enough. Yes. No, that, well, that, 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 I'm sorry, that, that is helpful for me. Thank, thank you very much. Um, you, you, you usually go back to the grounds on page three. You use the word vitiated in ground two. Yes, this ground has been um, rather sort of re 
frame within the um, skeleton that starts, which consolidates the ground, which is at 97. At 97 uh, which paragraph will I've got it separately? Um, <coughs> so it's at page 115, and I'm going to give you the references. Which paragraph in the skeleton? So paragraph 16, and paragraph 18 is round 2. It's page 121 of the bundle. My Lord, ground two, one or two, ground one, you can see in paragraph 86 onwards, and ground two at 90, uh, ground two at 94 onwards. Yes. So we can treat the original grounds as, in your, your mind, amended to follow the, the scope of page 121 onwards. Uh, yes, my lord. I think we say at the beginning of this skeleton, paragraph one, the skeleton consolidates the grounds from reply and updates several factual circumstances. So it is, in effect, a consolidation of the grounds and the reply in further on. Ground. My Lord, I do have, I can thread you through to show you that all the points are made, uh, and I have all the references. Uh, it is uh, not um, quite how, it, it's not quite as clearly set out as um, I would hope that all the points are there in, uh, <coughs> in the original grounds, which is why we haven't applied to amend. <coughs> so, what we seek, my lords, is that the court. Just, just in, in yes. relation to the declaration, the, the declaration uh, as to corrupt and illegal practices, it, the declaration you really seek, as I understand your submissions, it, is a declaration that um, the practices during the referendum uh, were corrupt and illegal practices such that they would be sufficient uh, to void the vote uh, if the vote had been binding. Yes. Uh, that, that's because it, the, 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 yes. the commission's made what the findings it's yes. made. Um, but you want more than that yes. from, the, from the court. Yes. You, you want a, a declaration yes. that those findings um, uh, would be sufficient to um, void the vote if it had been yes. binding. And then it's a matter for the Prime Minister and Parliament to decide what to do with that information. If yes. one fails yes. on yes. grounds three and yes. four, yes. obviously. Yes, thank you very much. <coughs> now, um, we are therefore asking the Administrative Court to be an arbiter of law, not of fact. The facts have been found beyond reasonable doubt by uh, the uh, Electoral Commission. And I note that the Woolis case in tab 20 uh, makes it clear that the Judicial Review Court has jurisdiction uh, in matters of law even when there is a, an electoral court involved.
Uh, our first point is that this court does have declaratory jurisdiction in this context, in or, which in order to uphold the fundamental right to vote in a lawful election, it should, we say, exercise. In this regard, the absence of a statutory mechanism to question the legality of electoral, the electoral process does not mean that the jurisdiction of the court is excluded. On the contrary, it's the very reason we say that the court should exercise uh, its discretion. And I didn't take you to the bit of the Scottish Law Commission uh, where it effectively says this. It's in paragraph 77 of our skeleton. But we say it's for three reasons. First, the trite principle that common law runs absent express exclusion by parliament. Even here, we say exclusion by parliament uh, would arguably not be constitutionally legitimate uh, because of the fundamental constitutional right to vote that the case involves. Secondly, here, not only has Parliament not excluded the common law, uh, but he has chosen not to import the provisions of section 1642, and I take my Lord's point that it may have been inappropriate to do that because the result was only advisory. Nevertheless, under section 129 of PARA, uh, the Minister does have um, power to import provisions uh, or provide for them. <coughs> Thirdly, um, by reference to the Ashby case, for example, and the case of Muhan, uh, the court has jurisdiction to enforce and give effect to the right to vote in a lawful election. Uh, and as I showed you in the Faulkner case, um, that is a right that actually belongs to the entirety of the electorate. It's a right not merely to tick a box, but to tick a box in a lawful process. <coughs> Here, the electorate had a right to express their will freely and fairly, that is, in a process that was conducted lawfully and, importantly, free of corrupt and illegal practices. We submit that the beyond reasonable doubt findings of the Commission are more than sufficient to show that the referendum process involved corrupt and illegal practices. And this is a slightly more, it's a more complex part of the case. I'm going to hand you up a table that we've done. Um, don't believe we're going to have time to go through the detail of this by reference to provisions. This would be something that would be considered uh, at a full hearing. Um, my Lord reminded to give permission. Uh, what we do here is we cross-refer the sections of the, um, <coughs> the sections of uh, PARA that apply to the referendum with specific codifications of corrupt and illegal practices in the RPA. So, my lords, we would say two things. First, um, the High Court might examine by reference to the statutory code, the statutory code embodying the common law. And secondly, the um, High Court uh, might examine it in the light of the wider principles set out uh, by Lord Denning in Morgan and Simpson. Now, Mr Justice Oosley accepted that this, this argument was not unarguable, uh, but dismissed uh, the claim for being out of time. <coughs> The short answer to this, the timing point, is that again we are within time for this challenge. This is not a challenge to the outcome of the referendum by way of a time-barred statutory procedure equivalent to that in the RPA. Parliament has provided no procedure at all since the result was merely advisory. It's a claim in law requesting the court to use its declaratory jurisdiction to apply findings by the Electoral Commission. So it's based on those findings. So again, time begins to run 
when those, t those findings were made public. Without those findings, the claimants would have no grounds, put another way, the grounds arose from those findings. We could not establish before this court that the illegalities which were found by the Electoral Commission uh, had taken place. There is no statutory mechanism to do so. It's the Electoral Commission that is left to do that. The fact that the Electoral Commission was so slow and indeed had to be judicially reviewed before they even uh, opened an investigation and then made these findings is not uh, the claimant's fault. Further, it could be said that it was only when the Electoral Commission made its determinations that the claimants were notified that their rights had been infringed, the right to vote in a lawful process, in respect of which they have a right to a remedy, um, this being the only remedy available. The case of Anu Prieva makes clear that time runs from knowledge and that, right, that rights have been breached, in that case, the termination of asylum rights. <coughs> and that case is at tab 24. Uh, I'll just give you the references because of time. Paragraphs 26, 28, and 30. Only at the point when the claimants knew that their right to vote within a lawful process had been breached could they seek a remedy to vindicate those rights, which is what they are doing. Now, there is something Kafkaesque as described by Lord Steyn in Anya Frieva of being told that the referendum must be treated as lawful because the regulatory authorities only established that it was not at a date when it's too late for the individual to rely on that finding, even though he had no other route of challenge. We submit this is not fair, and it therefore does not accord with our uh, law and traditions of public law and constitutional law. <coughs> um, uh, uh, in respect of this, which concerns the um, referendum, uh, are you saying that um, time did not start to run until July 2018? Or, or are you, and this is how I thought it was being put, uh, saying that time did start to run, um, uh, back in, um, uh, back when the uh, referendum had taken, uh, was taking place, uh, but that the time should be extended. Uh, my lord, I've put it in both ways. I was at the first. I was just explaining why uh, I say that time starts to run when the electoral commission made findings, um, because we say only at that point did we have grounds to seek a declaration. So the grounds for seeking the relief only arose when the Electoral Commission gave its findings. And that was when we were notified first that our right to take part in a fair and lawful process had been breached, such that we had a right to vindicate uh, that uh, position by coming to the court for declaratory relief. So uh, we say two things. First, first, it only arose at that point because we're asking the court deal with it. And secondly, we could, we didn't uh, know our rights had been breached and therefore time in the Anya Frieva, Anya Frieva case uh, says time starts to run from knowledge of date of breach of your rights. Um, but the second way we put it is that if uh, you're not with me on that, uh, we do say that it's appropriate to extend time and indeed that it would be inappropriate to refuse to extend time on the basis of administrative convenience. First of all, uh, the extremely serious implications of what has happened and will potentially happen, the removal of rights and freedoms of millions of peoples of businesses, people and businesses on the back of an unlawful and thus undemocratic process. Implications for faith in the rule of law and democracy uh, in the context of such an enormous change to the Constitution, i.e. cheating being allowed to pass without judicial comment. Secondly, the need for the executive and parliament to understand the nature of the offences found 
and the import that they would have in a normal election. So, my Lord, that is precisely your point in terms of the declaratory relief. Essential that Parliament and the Executive understand the significance by reference to the importance that they would have in a binding vote. Set thirdly, the fact that the claimant simply could not have known the basis for the referendum result until the Electoral Commission had completed its investigations. It had no other route. <coughs> um, and I, I won't take you to Younger and Burkett again. <coughs> so those are our submissions on ground one and why what we say it is and why we say it's within time or an extension should be granted. Ground three. In relation to this ground, our submission is that it is inconceivable that a rational actor would have triggered Article 50 knowing uh, what is known now. The Prime Minister's decision to proceed was based on a fundamental error of fact which she could not have known and we assume she did not know, namely that the referendum had been uh, conducted unlawful, unlawfully and that the result therefore uh, did not properly reflect the will of the people. So she proceeded on the basis of the contrary position <coughs> and we say it's inconceivable that had she known that was not the case she would have uh, made the notification. Uh, uh, on the, the corollary of that is it's inconceivable that, that anyone with the power to do so um, w would continue with the process knowing now what we do. Well, that is our submission on ground two. We say it's wholly irrational to simply ignore and to continue. When as a I'm sorry, yeah, there's, there are two, there are two different strands here. Um, we're now looking at a different one. Um, we're not looking at consideration of the evidence. Uh, we're, we're, ground three said it's inconceivable that the uh, respondent would have triggered the notification knowing now what we all know. Um, I, I put it to you, and I think this must be right, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a logical corollary that it would be inconceivable that anyone with the power to do so would proceed with the process knowing those same things. Well, my Lord, not necessarily, because, uh, and that would, uh, if, if the Prime Minister went to Parliament and took, explained, took the view, or, or took the view that she, um, She might decide to take the view that although it was not the democratic will of the people, it was not lawful, we were so far down the road that it would cause um, more disruption to stop. Now that would be subject, uh, no doubt, to challenge. Not, le not least because of the fourth ground of challenge in this case, which is the virus challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm still going to focus on the question that, that I asked. Um, and as you say, if she did that, that would be open to challenge. But on, on the basis of, the, 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 of your premise, um, the challenge would succeed because it's inconceivable um, that she would plow on in those circumstances. I, I, I'm just saying that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a logical corollary of the proposition you put it as ground three. Well, it is in the sense that it is inconceivable that a Prime Minister in this country would proceed to take the country out of the EU on the basis of an unlawful vote. No, no, quite. So, so yes. I, I think, um, I, 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 but, I, well, I was trying to think of any particular situation where she might argue that that's, we're so far down the line that even though uh, it was unlawful uh, and even though 
we can't be sure that it was the will of the people, we're still going to do it. Uh, and but you would say that that was a perverse in a legal sense? Yes, my Lord, I would. You're right. The only rider to that, I, I might suggest, uh, would be were she to consider the position so ground to, and then decide that the step she was going to take was to go to Parliament and say, this is the legal position, for example, I've considered it, um, we are going to uh, ask Parliament for its view, for example as to what we should do in that situation. She might take a... <coughs> the most rational response, in my submission, would be to hold another vote. Uh, but it could be said that as long as she went to Parliament with the position, she could have her decision um, uh, protected, if you like, from judicial challenge by parliamentary approval. But isn't that a submission that um, uh, a parliament could quite properly act irrationally? Yes, my lord, and parliament could. Parliament can act irrationally. Sometimes does. <laughs> I didn't quite. <laughs> I <don't understand. laughs> uh, and parliament equally could have decided not to follow the advisory referendum. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No one was a. It, it was advice. So um, we say that uh, there was obviously a a factual error in her decision um, that she could not have known and did not know at the time, and uh, the fact that it came later doesn't matter for the purposes of judicial review, provided time is extended. Um, because of the E case, which it, is... It isn't the fourth, um, isn't the fourth um, criteria in Lord Justice Carl Mott's judgment in, in paragraph 66 of E, um, that the mistake has to be material? Yes, my Lord, and it's wholly material here. It's the only basis for the decision. So the only uh, basis for the decision was that it was the democratic will of the people. Uh, if it wasn't as a matter of law and that's our submission, uh, then it was material. Uh, so my Lord's obviously familiar. I won't take you to paragraph 66 then. Um, now the Prime Minister at 44 to 45 of her grounds says there wasn't an error of fact because the illegalities were public knowledge at the time of triggering Article 50. Um, now we didn't know whether she was in effect saying that she knew about them and triggered nonetheless. Uh, and asked her detailed questions in a request for further information to which we've not received responses. But she had now said before the High Court that she did not know of the illegalities. That's paragraph 20 of their skeleton. Instead, she says that everyone knew of the investigations. What she ignores, however, is that the Electoral Commission had closed its investigation into vote leave on 21 March 2019. And, uh, 2017. And of course, a closure of an investigation by the regulatory body into the main campaign uh, should have given her uh, confidence uh, that everything was uh, as it should have been. It's no answer in our submission to say, as the defendant does at paragraph 25 of their skeleton, that it was known that there was some misconduct. Uh, it's not correct, but even if it was, one would have to know what vaguely that misconduct was. And no answer at all has been provided in relation to this. <coughs> so at the time the Prime Minister took her decision, 
the result of the referendum was a result that arose uh, from an unlawful referendum. Uh, the Prime Minister, as far as we know, did not uh, know this. And moreover, in stating that she was acting on the basis of the democratic will of the people, uh, she was presumably uh, legally advised uh, that that was the proper uh, democratic will of the people, i.e. a lawful process. Um, ground four, I can be very short. It is at paragraph 104 of our skeleton. And the very simple point is... Um, Sorry, I say skeleton. I mean the original detailed skeleton. The very simple point is that the Section 1 of the 2017 Act, which empowered uh, the Prime Minister to notify, by granting and in granting the Prime Minister that power, we say Parliament cannot have intended to empower the Prime Minister to take the United Kingdom out of the EU in circumstances where she had no democratic mandate to do so. And that is a simple virus point. <coughs> If, 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 if that was Parliament's intention, and Parliament, of course, now, knowing what we, we all know, um, could, could take action in that regard. Yes, well, we... But, I mean, Parliament could stop the process. Yes, well, we can't judicially review Parliament, my lord, and uh, from our, at the moment, the power is, in, is with the executive in relation to Article 50. The, pri the Prime Minister and the government are in charge of the Article 50 process. May, it may change next week, but at the moment that is the position. Yes. Um, is, is that everything on the substantive grounds and timing? Yes. What do you want to say on costs? So, my Lord, our position on costs is that uh, the circumstances of this case are a crowdfunded action uh, in which uh, there is uh, pretty much... Uh, no money, we are not, we're not in a Mount, we're talking about the, the Mount Cook case, we're not in a situation where there is a well-funded... Uh, don't, don't we have to ignore the, 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 that aspect of the cost? Don't we have to ignore um, how the um, applicant is funded? My Lord, on, I have the Mount Cook case. Paragraph 6. But I'm sorry, which, where is it? I, I will hand it up to you. I have brought no. the case. <coughs> so on page 227... the unsuccessful claimant has substantial resources which it has used. I'm sorry, which, which paragraph is it? Sorry, paragraph 6, page 227. So the, the starting position um, is uh, that it would be an exceptional circumstance in the costs of the hearing. Um, and a relevant factor for the court would be if the uh, claimant had substantial resources. And that is absolutely not the case here. This is a crowdfunded case in which... Uh, the, the lawyers are pretty much um, close to unfunded uh, and um, it is a position in our submission. And, 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 and there was evidence before Ms. Justice Usley as to that. Just, um, I, I believe just submissions were made uh, in relation to that. Uh, in our submission, this is a very important public interest case, 
and Mr Justice Sousley did not follow the same approach as had been taken by the Divisional Court in the Webster case to Fox, um, but uh, agreed that all the costs of the defendant uh, should be paid uh, out of those crowdfunded uh, resources. So in our submission, this, uh, this is a case that uh, warrants um, required to be brought before the courts uh, and it is not, uh, it is a case where the discretionary um, position should be that either reduced costs awards should be made or uh, costs uh, should lie where they fall. I'm, I'm just trying to think through the, the because although the court's got a, a broad discretion on costs, um, the cost sort has to be made on a principle basis um, and I'm just trying to, to grapple with what principle you rely upon to say that in this case there were not exceptional circumstances in which um, uh, Mr Justice Oosley could not properly have made the order that he did this was uh, the, 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 the general rule of course is that, that um, on an application for permission to proceed with a judicial review, uh, the um, uh, defendant um, is entitled to costs of preparing the acknowledgement of service and summary ground. Okay. And the cases make very clear why that is. Uh, that's because no work is involved. They put in a short statement. They're not entitled to say anything. They don't say anything. They don't get paid for uh, turning off at any oral hearing. That's the normal case. But this wasn't a normal case. But my lord, those those costs were awarded by Mr. Justice Substance in his. No, no, uh, I, uh, no, I understand that. Yeah. No, I understand that. But but in terms of the costs of the oral hearing, um, th this was not a, 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 a case in which um, the um, the claim was very short uh, and um, did not warrant any response at the permission stage by the. Uh, by the defendant. The, well, the, the Lord, skeleton it, argument was position, 48, 48 position, pages long. The position cannot be that because the case is particularly serious and important, um, <coughs> the cost should be awarded of the... I, I didn't the, say that. I didn't say that. The, what, what I said was that the, the, the usual order for costs in these cases, what's, what's known as the Mount Cook order, is that the defendant is not entitled to costs of turning up to the hearing. That's because... They aren't entitled to say anything. Normally, they aren't allowed to say anything. Uh, and their response in the summary grounds uh, very short because the claim is very short. Uh, if it gets past muster, then everything um, on both sides is developed at the substantive hearing. But this, this claim wasn't brought on that basis. This claim was brought um, with heavy artillery. I mean, the, the skeleton argument is 48 pages. That's the well, skeleton Lord, argument. I, I'm, I'm not aware of authority that suggests that if it's a <coughs> heavy or difficult case, the rule is somehow different. No, what the authorities say is that normally it's a straightforward case and yes. that is why the rule is as it is. And that, that appears in Mount Cook and Davian and in other authorities. Yeah. But is, isn't the corollary of that is that exceptional circumstances as used by Lord Justice Old in Mount Cook, um, why can't those include a case where um, it, it, it's, it's not absolutely straightforward. And, and a, a, a case where the uh, defendant um, is acting reasonably and proportionately uh, in responding, in giving oral submissions because requested to do so by the court at the oral hearing. I'm only putting that out as, yes. a, as a well, possible reason why this yes. may be exceptional. Well, I, I accept that, but um, I would refer you also to the exceptional circumstance, which is that if the uh, claimant has deep pockets, that uh, is also a, a reason why you might uh, order costs in exceptional circumstances. That is absolutely not the position no, in this that. case. And indeed, this case is perhaps comparable to the Webster case. And uh, the judges in that case did not take the view that the costs of the government in the oral hearing uh, should uh, be covered. I believe they had to pay two thousand in, in, in the Webster. Yes. 
And, and, and just one final point. Uh, no, no application was made to cap costs. In, no, no, no. I mean, that's, that's not a criticism, but just, no, uh, no. just to make sure that I've got the fact wrong. Thank you very much. Yes. Just a couple of further points. Seymour, is there anything you wish to say about Justice Usman's criticism of Professor Howard's report? No, my lord. The, the, we had not made. We had made an application to put that report in, but we didn't make the application orally, and it was not technically before the court because we considered that that was a matter for a full hearing. Um, there is a rider to his report, which he do, did. It's in the file where he explains uh, the or deals with the criticism. Has been made. In fact, it was produced before Mr. Justice Usley's. Is, uh, is that the 6th of December? Is that the 6th of December? Uh, where he explains uh, why the, the, the numbers look as they do. Uh, but in our submission, that would be a matter for a full hearing. So, so, what regard are we to have of Professor Howard's report? Because it uh, was, no. in our, was in our bundle. Uh, no, read it. no, it was put in there because it's referred to in the judgment, but actually it wasn't before the court in the sense that although a paper application had been made, we had not made an oral application and it was not dealt with in any way at the hearing at all. So you don't criticise Mr Justice Usley for, for, for not, not taking that into account in the, in the claimant's favour? No. But I do criticise him for holding it against us to that extent, yes. Because it wasn't, there was no argument about it at all, my lord. Yes, I see. I see. Thank you. You said a number of times that Mr. Justice Usually said that your common law argument was not unarguable. Um, it was arguable. But is that, is that absolutely right? Because in paragraph 65 of his judgment, he says that he considers it hugely improbable to the extent of being unarguable. So I need to look at the two. What, which paragraph can you refer? Paragraph sixty-four. He says, um, "I do not regard it as an unarguable proposition that a challenge to referendum could have been launched on common law grounds," which is what I assumed yes. you were referring to yes. when you said a number of times in your skeleton that you found it yeah. the common law argument arguable. But he goes on in paragraph 65, doesn't he, to say in practice it's unarguable in the last four lines. Yes, he considers it. Um, he says, whatever the arguable role of the common law might be, I consider it hugely improbable to the extent being unarguable common law would, in those circumstances, operate so as to avoid the referendum. Um, well, my, my Lord, um, the point I was making, perhaps I didn't make it sufficiently accurately, was that he was accepting as not unarguable that the common law uh, could run. The common law could run to analyse uh, the uh, practices and whether they constituted corrupt and illegal practices. Uh, what he then found as a merits um, position is that he didn't think that the illegalities found by uh, the Electoral Commission were sufficiently um, grave in substance uh, to render the process unlawful. He says more than that, doesn't he? That it's hugely improbable, to the extent of being unarguable, that in the context of this legislative structure, I mean, in a sense, you accept that to this extent, that you, you don't press now for a quashing order of the referendum. No, my lord, and we, uh, we don't. Well, or, or of anything, no, just uh, declaration. No, and, and um, we, ha we haven't sought to quash the referendum. Uh, the, in a sense, he's addressing the wrong question because we're not saying that the common law would operate um, so as to avoid the referendum because we're accepting 
that the referendum is advisory and you can only void something that has legal consequence.
everybody back in the room? Yeah, um, this one not there. Right. James, um, particularly as um, some of the points that have been made on the applicant's behalf this morning have been made um, at least with different emphasis from the um, skeleton arguments, um, we think that although this is an application for permission, um, it would be um, uh, right and helpful to give you an opportunity to respond to those uh, big points that have been made uh, on the applicant's behalf this morning. Now, um, uh, we assume you want to start now. We'll break one o'clock or shortly thereafter and recommence at two. Thank you. Well, I start then. I'm still a little uncertain as to whether we're dealing with quashing or we're not, but I think the quashing was preserved. It's preserved, And yes. the quashing was of the notice, as you will recall. Correct, yes. And on that basis, although no longer being said, formally at least, that the referendum needs to be or can be uh, voided or even the subject of a declaration, it is perfectly obvious that there's an almost direct link between the assertion of unlawfulness in relation to the conduct of the referendum and the quashing of the notice. So quite where the, the blue pencilling has got us to, I'm not entirely sure. But however that done, my submission is that on the <coughs> substantive uh, claim based on uh, some, form of, uh, some form of duty or some form of common law right, that species of claim can only be put in one of two ways. The first of them is to say that there is some form of constitutional right to have the notice revoked because of the alleged misconduct in the campaign at common law. And secondly, that there is now, and from some unspecified date prior to the claim, in effect a single rational option open to the Prime Minister, which was to revoke the notice on the basis of that unlawfulness. So a, a, a nominal discretion, if you will, but in effect narrowed down to one lawful way of exercising it. Got to be put in one of those two ways. So far as the positive duty is concerned, there is no statutory duty upon which my learned friend can rely. And there's no statutory duty in a sphere in which Parliament has regulated and specified consequences in other areas, including in the particular the RPAs, which I'll come back to, and didn't do so in relation to the 2015 Act. And no doubt the reason it didn't do so in relation to the 2015 Act is because the referendum was advisory. That's the Miller fact. And it was then for Parliament to decide, after Miller, what to do about the outcome of the referendum, whether to take legislative steps, what form that, that those steps should take, and so on. And that led to the 2017 Act, as you know and there have been subsequent legislative interventions since then. But one can contrast that position of an advisory referendum and no specification of uh, legal consequence flowing from um, uh, um, uh, misconduct during the course of the referendum campaigns. One can contrast that very specifically with the position under the RPAs. There, as you know, there are detailed provisions and detailed rules about the consequences of malpractice. You were taken to some of them this morning. The learned judge at paragraph 12 of his judgment summarises perhaps the key ones, and that may, may be just convenient to take that up to remind you of that. So, uh, Mr Justice Uzi's judgment, paragraph 12, if you would, 
and do you see the, the last four, four-ish lines of paragraph 12? He summarises one of the key distinctions that is drawn in the RPAs in relation to binding elections. So if a candidate is personally guilty of a corrupt or illegal practice, his election is void. But then it's also void, even if he hasn't been personally uh, guilty of those practices, if someone else has. And they, but then there is the materiality test introduced. You recall that. Uh, and so there's a critical distinction which is drawn in that legislative scheme, in the context of binding elections, between automaticity, if you will, of voidness, in certain circumstances, and in other circumstances, a clear test of materiality. So those consequences are set out with some clarity, and none of that features or is specified in the context of uh, misconduct in relation to the Advisory 2015 Act, or the Act that created the advisory referendum process. And so none of the RPAs translate automatically or at all into a context of a non-advisory referendum where Parliament has set it up differently as it has done under the 2015 Act. Indeed, if anything, that contrast is significant and telling precisely because of the nature, specificity, detail and nuancing of the scheme that Parliament has chosen to set up in relation to those binding elections. And that, of course, is relevant because it is of some significance to consider whether or not there is any scope for the common law to operate, to create in effect individual rights and duties and consequences and so on, in relation to a referendum of this kind having regard to that contrast. And it might be thought that the way of the world now is in relation to elections, and pretty much all of the old cases that my learning friend took you to were about binding elections, the world has been totally superseded. I think she accepted in terms the proposition put to her for obvious reasons by the court, which was, do you accept that the statutory intervention in that context has occupied the field? And the answer was yes. So that common law line of case law has been superseded, taken over, and rendered historic by the parliamentary intervention that there has now been in relation to binding. And we also know that in relation to non-binding, i.e. referendum, matters of that kind, advisory referendums, Parliament also intervenes to set up a process with limited powers or no powers to do the sort of things that used to be done. But in any event, what you, what you truly can't do, I submit, is to say, and this is the logic my learned friend deploys, well, here are some very old common law rules that used to deal with binding elections. I accept, she says, that legislation has now regulated and has occupied the field so as to supersede those and replace them in the context of binding elections with new, nuanced, detailed rules of the kind you see summarised in paragraph 12 of the judgment. Then to say, well, we are advisory, so we recognise that this is a different situation. It's not binding elections. It's not that sphere. It's not that legislation. It's not that common law. But in some way, because Parliament specifically, and for the avoidance of doubt in 1642, decided to say what it did, I can resurrect the common law as it used to apply in a totally different context in non-binding, and even though I recognise that Parliament has now consigned those rules to history and drag them back in to an, to an advisory context, brackets, in which Parliament has also intervened in the 2015 Act. And that is just nonsensical, I respectfully submit. So, no statutory duty is the first point on positive, the positive duty way of putting it rather than the rationale, only one rational option way of putting it. For all of those reasons, that contrast is important. The second point under no, no positive duty is that even if theoretically there was still some scope for common law to operate, it cannot tenably 
create a, a, a right of the kind that my learned friend asserts and needs, which in effect flows to the need to quash the, the notice because of the attack on the referendum. And it cannot do so, so even if there's still some scope for common law to operate, the question then is, how would it operate? What are the arguments around the nature of its operation, the nature of the duty or the right? Firstly, there is no duty of the kind which is anything remotely equivalent to the duty that she would need in the case law, either directly or by analogy. So what duty are you focusing upon? Well, I, I know it's the duty that the applicants rely on, but, but, but it's a duty, I think, I think she says, well, there's a, there's a duty in common law to intervene in some way, shape, or form to require the quashing of the notice. And that can only sensibly be because the referendum was unlawfully conducted and therefore steps that were taken afterwards are vitiated at common law. I think it's the nature of that. I'll come to the, I'll come to the more, much more limited declaration that she seeks in a moment. Yes, but it was... It was um, the submission was founded on cases which concern the right to vote. It seems to me to be a... Fundamentally different thing. Fun fundamentally different thing. Um, uh, well, that's what I was, that, that, that was the point under this. All the cases she took you to were about A, binding elections, and so not us, because the referendum is advisory only. But secondly, the right to vote. My Lord is right. But which is an individual right. Which is an individual right. No doubt it could be a right to vote in accordance with the modalities of, that are set up in accordance with the right to vote, who can vote, prisoners or not, that sort of thing, which was the, the Muhan uh, case. But they are about those things. They are not about um, advisory referenda. And they are not about the consequences... Uh, I, I say that the, the, the common law cases were in the context of binding uh, uh, elections about the consequences, but they have now been superseded. It was the point I made earlier. Parliament has now intervened to create the nuanced rules. And so the common law simply doesn't create this sort of duty. The, the case law doesn't provide a compelling analogy. This isn't incremental development of case law that would naturally slot over for all of the reasons of non-analogy just given, binding, not advisory, right to vote, not consequences, but also because the contrast now exists with the RPAs. Those are really the points in relation to that. But the second objection, or the second concern that one would have, or the court would have, in being invited to create anything like that species of, 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 of duty, is that there would be fundamental objections to its intervention to invent a duty or a right of that kind. <clears throat> and that is because to introduce, as it were, uh, such a common law right or duty would indeed, it is submitted, cut fundamentally across parliamentary will. It simply couldn't stand with the advisory nature of the referendum, the fact that Parliament has authorised and approved the giving of the notice in March 2017, following Miller. It couldn't stand with the fact that Parliament has passed the 2018 EU Withdrawal Act. EU law comes back and becomes part of domestic law on the date of exit and so on. All of that is inconsistent with it. And that remains the position and is the basis on which parliamentary legislation sits and on which Parliament is now continuing to proceed. But, but that, that also, doesn't it, from recollection, um, that, that is the act in which the, the provision that um, Parliament has to approve any deal or indeed no deal. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Well, I think it may be, but uh, irrespective of that's right or, or not, the point my Lord makes is, a, is nevertheless a sound one, irrespective of the precise terms, because what it does and what it represents is the parliamentary answer to what do we do on exit day. So if you look at the parliamentary sequence, 
we had the Miller debate. <laughs> An act had to be produced saying, yes, I authorise you to send this Article 50 notice, Parliament stage one, as it were. The notice is then sent directly pursuant to the parliamentary authority then conferred. No one was under any doubt what was going to happen the day after the act was enacted. But then Parliament has to think about, well, what are we going to do now? We've now got the clock ticking. We're 40 days away from the end of two years, but the clock will start ticking to two years down. And we've now got to work out, in the meantime, what do we do with EU law and all of that? But, 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 but your, your, your submission on this is um, c concerned the parliamentary con control over the uh, uh, overarching control over the procedure. It is. And, and, the, and the difficulties that that will create in our particular context of the court now trying to fashion, as it were, a common law right of the kind or duty yeah, of the kind that my learned friend needs. But I mean, that's one objection, which is it cuts directly across parliamentary will. My Lord, I'm sorry. Your central point on this is that Parliament has moved its tax onto, onto whatever, a different law. whatever law was left um, by a gap for common law because it has gripped this issue. Yes, I mean, that you, you can take the legislative will at, at any point. The RPA, the RPAs and the 2015 Act on the very setup of these and the consequences specified is one as it were, aspect of parliamentary will. This aspect is a rather different one, which, as my Lord rightly describes, involves Parliament having taken the process forward um, and decided that it's going to move on. It's going to authorise the giving of the notice. It's going to decide what happens when exit happens and the EU law continues to exist and all of that. And implicitly, you say it's, it's done that in the context of all, all this matter that has been relied on. Yeah, well, we know Parliament knows all about these, the, the things that my learning friend principally relies upon, which is the Electoral Commission report, because uh, Parliament's been having committees that have been looking at this for, for ages. The DCMS committee looked at it, and uh, then the Electoral Commission reports are published in a blaze of publicity and so on. I'll come back to them in a moment. But Parliament is well alive, as the Prime Minister is, to all of these developments, as it were. They know about the allegations of Russian interference with the referendum and all of that, but they've decided to carry on. And the courts are not in the business of saying that Parliament has legislated in England, it's that Parliament and the sovereign makes decisions. And you, you're essentially saying is that Parliament has decided that notwithstanding the past, it's going to continue with this process. Exactly so. I might all just to finish that point, and that might be a convenient moment if I, do, if I finish then, but, but, but the, <coughs> I'm still on the fundamental objections to the invention of the sort of right or duty that the common law does. First one is cutting across parliamentary will. Second objection to the invention of this sort of right or duty is that common law just doesn't operate in that way to invent rights or duties or remedies of this kind, replacing, in effect, discretion and judgments by the executive and the legislature with hard-edged duties and it doesn't do so for basic constitutional reason and that is because there are plainly real controversies and uncertainties and decision making of a purely legislative kind to be done about the nature of the duty one only has to one only has to posit the nuanced legislative solution in the context of binding elections and the sort of subtlety of distinction that the learned judge drew attention to in paragraph 12 of his judgment to see the nature of the judgments that would need to be made. What's going to happen in relation to uh, uh, challenging or attaching automatic or semi-automatic legal consequences to misconduct in an advisory referendum? Are, 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 those who are authorised, uh, as it were, to participate as lead participants in the campaigners, to be treated exactly the same as though they were electors, so that if they misconducted themselves in this way, it was automatically void? Or is the looser rule to be applied, which requires materiality? You'll remember that distinction in paragraph 12. How is the court to determine which of those is the right answer in the context of the 2015 Act? It's just simply impossible to see how the court could be in a position to define the right or duty for which my learned friend needs to contend. And my, my lords, I'll tee up the point and then stop.
because we're already a bit beyond time on the short adjournment. But, but, but the, the third point I'm going to make, um, under, still under positive duty, is that even if the common law might bring something over by way of analogy, it would on no view be equivalent to an automatic voiding on the back of misconduct. And so all the points I've made up till now, up till this third point, as it were, are prior points to the critical reasoning of Mr. Justice Oosley, which focused on this. And my Lord, Lord Justice Haddon Cave was right to say to my learned friend, well, hang on a second, you can't undersell the actual reasoning of the judge on this issue. What he concluded was he could see, although he thought it was highly improbable, and I respectfully submit he was right to think it was highly improbable and probably should have gone further, but what he did then say was even if there's some scope for common law to drift over into the advisory sphere, the nature of that sort of duty would look nothing like an automatic voiding. It would have to have materiality um, attached to it. Soundly based, I'm quoting from paragraph 67, six or seven lines in, soundly based grounds for believing that the outcome would have been different had the illegal acts not taken place. So even if one can overcome all the other objections, you've still got to try and define the right, arguably. And the learned judge says it needs to have, it would, on any view, it would need to have a materiality moniker attached to it. And that's how he gets into Professor Howard. Oh, I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit <coughs> over. I'm not going to be very long. I shall be half an hour after lunch, if that's acceptable. Um, no, no, I mean, we'll, we'll break now. In those submissions, you said that the common law can't operate in that way, the way that the applicant suggests, to, in, to invent rights and remedies of this kind. And um, in terms of remedies, um, I, I don't think any, uh, obviously all of the cases are concerned with elections, as, as, as traditionally known. Yeah. And, and we know, at least from Lord Denning's judgment in Morgan, that the history of that, because he said it had um, helped in a, uh, and at some length. And what he said was that the, court, the courts, the courts of law, had absolutely no part to play in this until whenever it was, 1869, I think, when Parliament... When Parliament gives them permission to get stuck in? Yes. Um, <laughs> And, and I just wondered whether um, I, I understand that the common law may have something to say about the right to vote, um, but I, I'd be interested to hear as, as to whether you say that um, it, it has nothing to say about a, a, a remedy of quashing an election, because they're all election cases, um, a, a outside the powers given to them by Parliament. Yeah. I mean, my, my short submission is going to be that there is there is no such power. So, uh, because there are no cases? And, and that, that because there are no cases and because Parliament has taken over. It, it is evident that in the progressive scheme of legislation that has occurred... I, I mean, Lord Denning's point was that Parliament didn't take over. It was always Parliament. If you go to make a, a, quite. But I, I, I know what you mean. But, but so, so it, it's a that they, sure but they haven't given anything away yeah. um, in, in that. And, and there are no cases, as far as you were aware, to support that proposition. Um, sh shall we say ten past two? Good. Thank you very much.